Hope you we are all good. Looking uh, looking forward to the solution that you guys will be creating. So excited.
Okay, let's see uh, if those that are following us online can hear us. Okay, um, we have confirmed those that are following online on YouTube can also hear us. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's good to see that we are having this kind of events again after you know two years of COVID. And before we now start with our official program, program, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the presence of our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Harold Norman. Thank you for being with us here today. And this really just shows from the university how important the university takes initiatives such as these that are aimed at actually um, create, making sure that our young people are prepared for the fourth industrial revolution. In the same, the same vein, I also like to welcome the special advisor, the vice chancellor, Mr. Clemens Avara. Uh, thank you, sir, for coming. And I would also like to, um, to acknowledge the presence of our, um, our DVC, uh, Dr. Collins, the DVC for, um, I think DVC for research, innovation and partnerships. Thank you, sir, for being here with us. And I would also like to acknowledge um, my boss, uh, the acting executive dean in the Faculty of Computing and Informatics, Prof. Pungai uh, Bunushava, um, who um, is also present here with us. Uh, let me also, before we spend too much time, also acknowledge the presence of um, our keynote speaker for today, uh, Professor Michael Page, um, who is an associate professor um, and head of a high energy stereo, uh, stereoscopic system, the HES, a recent unit. At, uh, the Namib, at the University of Namibia. Thank you, sir, for being here with us. Um, welcome all to the official uh, ceremony of the NASDARA Data Science School. Um, I really thank you for being here as, as a participant and everyone that is following. Um, the amount of applications that we have had for this uh, Data Science School was enormous. Because in the space of one week, we had almost 180 people that wanted to be here. But because of the venue, we can we could not accommodate everyone. Um, so the people that you see here are really the cream of the crop of all those 182 applicants. So give yourself a round of applause for being here. Um, my name is Lamek Ambangula Mogongo. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty of Computing. So for this event, I will be your master of ceremony. So for housekeeping, um, if you go out uh, straight and then immediately right, you will be able to see the uh, bathrooms there. Um, let's not waste time and actually get on to our events. So the overview of this official ceremony will have an official welcoming from our vice chancellor, Dr. Errol Naumann. Um, who will officially welcome us, uh, officially open the 
the NAS Data Science and uh, NAS Data Data Science School, and welcome all of us at this beautiful building. Is it not beautiful? Yes. So this is the future of computing in Namibia. The uh, HTTPS, the High Tech Transfer um, Plaza Select. So um, and then after that, we we'll then have uh, a talk by uh, Professor Michael Bage on application of data science in astronomy, and then another one by uh, Dr. El Eli Kasai on introduction to machine learning. And then after that, we have a vote of thanks from Professor uh, Fungai Bunushaba. Then I will have a nice picture taken, and after that, we have a tea break, and then hopefully we'll be then re-energized for the remaining talks, which are going to be given virtually by uh, speakers who are both in, uh, in Scotland and um, England. One of them is my former supervisor. So I'm excited for those uh, talks as well. So without further ado, let me then call, um, it's my pleasure to call up um, Dr. Errol Norman, the Vice Chancellor of the Namibia University of Science and Technology, which is the Africa's the premier University of Science and Technology, to officially welcome us. Vice Chancellor. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lamek and Mukomo, for this opportunity. Good morning. Doesn't sound like it's good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Wonderful. Now it sounds much better. Um, may I take this moment to uh, set or observe the protocol as, as already said, Dr. Lamek? Um, but I will take a moment to acknowledge a few individuals. Um, Prof. Bacchus from UNAM, I think he's uh, a former colleague of mine. It's good to see you back in us. It means that uh, in Namibia and in the academic circles, you always mean, you always mean to know. good to see you again. I recognize, uh, of course, uh, the set of the special advisors here, and uh, Dr. Colin Stanley, who is the acting deputy vice chancellor of the Research Innovation Partnership, and uh, Prof. Funu Shaba, who is the acting executive dean, faculty of computing and informatics. I noticed there are a number of Key individuals also listed on my acknowledgements here. I see there's Dr. Eli Kasey from UNAM, uh, Dr. Eliana Vasquez Osorio from the University of Manchester in the UK. I believe they are online. And Dr. Edward Salapi from the University of Stern, also online. Um, Distinguished speakers, uh, distinguished participants. I, I was trying to understand the uh, kind of the distribution of the participants. I was asking Dr. Collins, then the reaction, who, who are the people in the room and where are they from? Um, so that I could appropriately recognize and work. And also, those who are online, I understand. They are from various countries, is that correct? Or they are all Namibians? Yes, yes, from various institutions, and they are professors and facilitators from various countries. Oh, I see. Now, I would like to know who is in the room. Just a little bit, I think, if you if you have the courage to um, just introduce yourself so that we get a sense of who is here. I know you will do this formally when I have left the room, but I want to know at least who am I talking to. Uh, just, just a moment, if you don't mind. If, if people don't have courage, I point you out. It's not, <laughs> it's typical of me now standing in front of the class. Now I'll become a lecturer once more. So I usually start from the ones at the far end. <laughs> huh? 
Um, feel free, feel free. Um, the lady at the far end. Or is it the gentleman? It's a bit dark, I can see. Yes, please. Yes. All right. What wonderful, wonderful. Um, and the gentleman on the on your right. Yes. But me? From NAS. Okay. NAS people, can you please rise? Students. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. You are home. You are home. Now, now I know that uh, how many are from NAS. Um, all the others, you may be seen. All the others from, from let's say, you know, you know, anyone from you know? Ah, wonderful, wonderful. I see, I see four of these four from you know. Um, please, you may be seated. Um, are you on? Ah, one. All right, next time we'll be more. Fun. Welcome, sir. Um, anyone else from other institutions? Please rise. So, God bless you. Thank you. Can you can you just say where you from? Welcome. Have you traveled? No, I was already here. Oh, already here. Mm -hmm. I thought you took a quick trip. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I am actually studying the same institution. Oh, okay. Long way from India. <laughs> uh, it, it is delightful, of course, to see participants uh, from various institutions converging here. So I acknowledge your presence. Um, I'm pleased to work tonight. I was wondering when I read the program, the briefing notes, I was wondering what is this? Tara, Tara. I thought this is Tara, one of our local languages. You, you must check out. <laughs> so I thought, I thought, what is this Tara? And I try to conceptualize what its main purpose is. But before I get to that, I recognize the entities that makes a great contribution to this initiative. Um, I understand that the South African Department of Education, what is it called now? South African Department of Science and Innovation is making a significant contribution to this initiative as well as the United Kingdom Mutual Fund by other science and technology specific schools. So on the onset, I would like to recognize the contributions of those entities. Um, then I understand also that this initiative started sometime back in 2018 um, uh, when several uh, colleagues and entities came together and um, uh, discussed on the possibilities of utilizing what I now observe as um, the, um, hold on, let me just get that correct, data, which stands for development in Africa will rate your astronomy. So that's what that means. Development in Africa with radio astronomy. And today we are witnessing a significant, significant outcome of those discussions. We are witnessing the launch of the NAS Data Data Science in 2022. So congratulations to all those colleagues who are proponents of this initiative. Um, I also I'm informed that uh, this project will contribute to skills development in several African countries. Um, that includes Namibia, Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, and Zambia. Uh, these are the countries who made a contribution or development towards the frequency instrument of 
telescope in South Africa. Um, then the, the other aspect that is significant in terms of this school today is that, of course, it will make a significant contribution in terms of skills to what we particularly as it pertains to the STEM fields, science, um, technology, engineering, uh, and uh, mathematics. Um, of course, it will co contribute towards institutional capacity development, particularly as it relates to um, training or development of uh, modern astronauts, astronomers who are knowledgeable in the natural sciences. And, and, and I put emphasis on the natural sciences because I understand that through this uh, NAS uh, data, uh, data science school, we look at several areas of education, which includes agriculture, health, Understand also in the living test. You do have uh, looking at core competencies. Uh, as I said, agriculture, healthcare, and also um, environmental sciences. Um, how does this dovetail with our strategic direction? It's important from two perspectives. First of all, uh, NAS in our new vision has a strong focus on digitalization. And we will see the emergence of the HTTPS building where we host these, um, the indication of our strategic intent. But also, um, we have developed academic programs that speaks specifically to data science. We have, and I think this year we have enrolled students in our first master's in data science so far. Um, with more than 30 students uh, enrolled in this program, which is an indication of um, our determination to make a significant contribution to, towards the, um, the, the, the utilization of the fourth industrial revolution to drive our um, uh, developmental imperatives. I'm also informed that um, this uh, initiative um, received uh, quite widespread interest. I'm informed that uh, in, when the uh, a call for applications were launched, more than 172. Uh, individuals express interest out of that through a rigorous process. Uh, 30, 30 selected persons in person. I understand the rest of the participants are online. It shows that uh, this, there is really strong interest in this area. But I also think that uh, if uh, um, conditions would have allowed all the 172 participants should actually be present. But nonetheless, I think those of you who are seated here in this room are fortunate. But the rest of the colleagues, uh, participants who are online, are nonetheless also competing at uh, quality, quality, and interaction. Um, I am also informed that uh, in, in this uh, initiative, the participants will uh, participate actively in projects uh, through a hackathon, through a hackathon, and this is intended to build commensurate skills in the application of data science. But one of the things that they would embark upon as part of the project Another tip is to look at the perennial issue that we are faced with as a country, um, and that is to do with floods. I understand that uh, this is a challenge sufficient to come up with 
um, solutions in terms of how to adequately predict the flight. I'm interested in that. So much so that I would like to be here when the solutions are being presented um, and uh, I suppose winners, was it winners? Winners will be announced because I think this is something that is so uh, um, predominant, so important to our athletes. And to see that there will be um, more than 100 minds converging on trying to sort, uh, I would be very keen to find out what the outcome of that uh, interaction is. Now, in conclusion, once again, allow me, uh, Director of uh, Proceedings, to uh, congratulate all the participants um, and encourage you to uh, take full advantage of this opportunity, uh, tap into the wisdom and resources offered by the colleagues who will be conducting the training and the skills transfer. Um, I wish you fruitful and engaging a uh, few days ahead, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Well, they, another round of applause for the DC. I think it is everything. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for that uh, warm welcoming. And um, start earlier, say the, um, the kind of um, the kind of support that we are getting from the institution, highest level, shows really what NAS is all about and the role that NAS will play in the digital transformation, not only in Namibia but across the continent and also uh, then hope to then contribute to the um, um, uh, to uh, contribute to also um, globally in around uh, science technology and innovation thank you very much DC um, next we will then have um, our, uh, the first talk um, by uh, professor Michael Bates which is on the introduction of uh, data science in astronomy. And Professor Bates has a long CV, but I'm just going to, as a professor should have, and I'm just going to highlight some of the few things. Um, he is the head of the Namibia, um, for, 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 the, for the Namibian Health Group um, uh, at UNAM, and he's also an astrophysicist uh, uh, professor at the, Namib at the University of Namibia as well as an extraordinary associate professor at Northwest University and uh, a visiting academic at the University of Oxford, UK. Uh, he graduated his PhD and master's in gamma ray astronomy from uh, TU Dortmund University. And he um, was appointed in 2018 as a member of the Global Young Academy and elected to the executive committee last year. So um, as part, he is a core um, principal investigator of the African Millimeter Telescope, AMT, and actively works on its establishment, its science program, and beside this hard science research, he pursues societal impact and activities in astrotourism and archaeoastronomy. I don't even know what is that. In Namibia. <laughs> so, of course, um, astro tourism, I understand, because you know, if you go out to Hindu, we have nice clear skies, there's not so much uh, interference, so you would be able to do some observation in, out there. So, um, without further ado, let me let us then welcome Professor Michael Bates to then enlighten us with this presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, first of all, Lamek, for this very kind and extensive introduction. Um, and uh, at least the very same level, thank you also for the very kind invitation you extended to me to um, give a bit of perspective from the astrophysics 
uh, here at this very nice event. Um, dear VC of NAST, dear DBC, dear um, acting executive dean, dear students or learners, well, I guess most of you, or some of you might not be students, but graduates. Um, first of all, I want to apologize. There is some incompatibilities in the talk between the computer I made it on to, to, the, Mac, to the Mac. So there are some hiccups, apologies for that, um, but we'll get through it. Um, yes, thanks again for not just having me here, but also for having us here in this very great building in which very nicely showcases, as was introduced by the VC, the um, not just the vision of NAS, but the importance of IT in the wider sense um, for uh, what people like to call the fourth industrial revolution. Um, as I was introduced, I am not a computer scientist, but I'm a physicist, and I want to bring you um, a bit of the story or the history of well why we are what what why we are here as I called it because you will note um, or at least I'll hope to show you in a few slides that there's quite some connection um, between this very event and astronomy. Well first of all let me very briefly highlight only that um, one can draw up a nice diagram like this, where you see that astrophysics or astronomy or that matter um, can be seen as being in the center of uh, many um, very hands-on activities. So people often ask, what, what, what is this blue skies research for? Yes, pun intended. Um, and you will find that it actually has quite a couple of um, connections also into the engineering um, direction. The one we want to focus on here in Plumic is um, obviously the one where the computing and big data aspect is the highlighted one. Continue here. So I said why we are here, and the VC has introduced it already. Well, the NAS Development in Africa Radio Astronomy Data Science School. Um, I want to highlight the Dara of it and where it comes from. And um, well, there's probably no one better to explain the history of that than the alumni here who actually studied in Manchester, but also the PI of the Dara Big Data Project, uh, Professor Anna Scaife is a professor in radio astronomy at uh, the Jordan Bank Observatory at Manchester University in the UK. And so you see it, it, that, that, that is where this connection between astrophysics or radio astronomy, in particular in this case, and um, these data science skills comes from. Now I want to showcase on this slide um, to you what, what, what the connection is and what I have encountered in my my little experience as, as academic is that if you talk to computer scientists, quite often they talk about some fancy procedures or some nice um, ways of how you have the human computer interaction. And well, that is all important. Please don't get me wrong. Um, but what I have noticed is that when it comes to well, actual problems in the sense of people having data and needing to deal with it, they're often a bit on the sideways because they don't produce data themselves. Mostly. And so it, 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 is, um, it is nothing bad, don't get me wrong. It, it, is, it lies in the very nature. Computer science is the um, methodologies field, so to say. And obviously it always needs an application to feed it with the problems to solve. And in astronomy, we happen to have many of the problems. And one of the, one, one, one of the major problems is what one, I want to highlight here, and that is the data rates of astronomical um, instrumentation, which are quite astronomical. The square kilometer array, which was um, mentioned by the, by the VC, is a project which is 
um, quite an international. It's the biggest science project on earth there is with the total capital investment beyond, I think, two billion US dollars. So it's it's, it's um, quite a bit of a uh, quite a bit of an elephant, so to say. Um, and a big portion of that is happening right here in Africa. And I think that's something which is remarkable by itself. Obviously, or well, maybe not obviously, but it's not surprising, it's driven by South Africa, but also as was mentioned, and I, I will have, I think on the next slide, um, yes, it is uh, not just South Africa, um, but also the eight African partner countries besides South Africa, and Namibia being one of them. It's important to, to note here that all these uh, partner countries have signed up to an intergovernmental agreement um, a couple of years back in support of the square kilometer array. And the plan is that in the second phase, so the first phase is currently being built in South Africa, and we're talking about about 100 telescopes. And there's a second phase, so an extension to that plant, which shall see quite a couple of telescopes in addition. So it's radio telescopes in this sense in the African partner countries. People have realized early on that, well, it's not, it doesn't work like just building telescopes somewhere and then everything will be arriving. Obviously, we need to develop a community in that context. And that's what um, is the main aim of the um, African VLBI network. The AVN is that we'll hear about uh, by Carla Sharp, I think, on Thursday uh, on Tuesday. And um, there's one project which, which Lamek mentioned in the beginning, um, which is close to my heart, which is the African Millimeter Telescope. That's a slightly different type of radio telescope, it has some different purpose. I don't want to go into all the details here. But it will most likely be um, the Namibian contribution um, to this African DLBI um, network. And um, well, it's a collaboration driven these days between UNAM and Rockport University in the Netherlands. Um, but we have also quite a couple of additional partners, and we're proud must be one of them. Um, yes, on the next slide, please. Um, but I also want to mention that we don't just have to look into the future um, when it comes to uh, astronomy in Namibia, but we also have already a rich history of more than 20 years, or essentially 20 years, of the Haas telescopes being situated right here and doing world-class science since. Um, so you just, I just brought you here uh, a, little, a little news um, news piece of two years ago, which celebrated the 20th anniversary of the groundbreaking for the first telescope. Um, so we're literally having 20 years of data taking um, this year. And you also see this very nice Namibian stamp, which was, which was issued by Nam Post. Um, but if you compare these pictures, you will see it was issued slightly before the actual instruments were in place. Thanks, Nam. Um, I brought you a little video here um, well, that's fine, that's fine. Um, which is to, 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 to showcase the Astros, but I want to highlight that obviously this is not just an Indian effort, but it's um, 240 or so scientists in 13 countries involved. It's mostly European, or we have some colleagues also in Australia, some in Japan, but obviously in Namibia and quite a couple in neighboring South Africa. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry for that. But we'll be, as I mentioned, we'll be getting there. I mean, if you can just um, reopen it and just jump to the next slide. Yeah. All right. What I want to show, and maybe I, I, I just continue talking while, while the slides are reopening. So, what is the what is the challenge or what is one of the challenges we face with us? Um, well, on the slide, on the square kilometer array, you saw those significant figures of, um, you know, was it two terabytes per second uh, data volume? 
but we, we are not there with the hand telescopes, right? We're, we're a bit more modest. We have only five telescopes, not a hundred. Uh, yes, it's also different technologies, um, but we still have data rate of several terabytes per night. And then every data set that you would analyze um, is not just one night of data, but then there's maybe a hundred or two hundred hours of data. So it's quite a significant amount of several tens or even a hundred terabyte that you have as raw data that which you need to um, which you need to um, um, be able to manage. Um, now here you should you, you should, should see a little video. Actually, this 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 is literally just a picture of one event as we were taking. So this is literally the camera plane, um, or actually it's the five camera planes of the five telescopes you see here, um, each of them having slightly less pixels than your mobile phone, so about 1,000 pixels each. But our pictures are taking a little faster than yours. Um, we literally take for each event that is triggered by a cosmic ray incident, we're not going into the astrophysics details here. Um, but each, each of the events that, that uh, triggers recording of the telescopes, we report 40 slices of one billionth of a second each in length. And we do that something like 500 times per second. Um, and with that, as I mentioned, we, we, we obtain data rates of a couple, maybe four or five terabytes per night. And um, the tricky bit here, and this is where um, I will sort of link to the next presentation to the main scheme of this whole week. Um, is then we oh, skip that. Is then that we face the problem that we need to find a needle in a haystack. So I just told you we record 500 or so videos per second. So it's, there's 500 cosmic events um, that we record per second, but only maybe one in a thousand to one in a million of those is actually telling us about its, um, its astrophysical origin. And we need to find out which ones are the good and which ones are the bad in a sense, or which ones are useful and which ones are not useful to us. So some are caused by gamma rays, that's called gamma ray astronomy, but the most majority is caused by charged cosmic particles that can finish on our atmosphere. So we have literally a lead needle in a haystack problem, um, which, which calls for um, uh, machine learning methods and classification. And I would say, well, it's much easier to find a needle if you have the proper means to do it. Um, as in, it, in this case, just illustrated um, by the magnet, but obviously um, when dealing with those data, the machine learning by itself is the magnet, magnet we use um, to see through all those data. Um, Dr. Kasai, who just, just afterwards um, gave a presentation on um, machine learning. Well, I want to, just think about briefly or reflect briefly on how do we handle um, large amounts of data. And as an example, in South Africa, there's at least two different institutes um, that take care of that. Um, there is the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences, which was recently renamed as previously National Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, and there you see the connection between physics and um, data science, so to say, and uh, IDEA, the Inter-University Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy. And I want to highlight IDEA a little bit because IDEA is one of the main supporters of um, the DARA or DARA Big Data Initiative. Um, also quite hands-on as you will, if I'm not fully mistaken, you will actually do your um, analyses that you will be doing here, actually we'll, we will be doing them virtually in Cape Town on the computers um, of IDEA. Um, so IDEA is, is, and that's the second point I want to highlight here, it is actually an institute in between 
different institutions between the University of Cape Town, the University of the Cape, Western Cape, um, University of Pretoria, um, and also Sarao, which is the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. And um, I want to some see that as a model which could nicely be imitated just here to pool resources. Um, the National um, Space Science and Technology Policy, which was launched last year, also explicitly talks about as one of their uh, one of their aims um, is to establish a high performance computing center. Um, well, with the very same idea that, um, well, it's, it's, it's needed to have people conversant in dealing with big data volumes. And uh, also there is again, the connection between space sciences um, and high performance computing. Um, at Yenam, we have taken the first, I can call it tiny step into that direction. Um, you know, what we call a virtual institute for scientific uh, computing and artificial intelligence, where um, some colleagues of, uh, from the departments of physics and computing, yes, their departments are slightly called different, but the names are lengthy, so I'll cut them short here, um, with the support of our PVC research, um, have um, started such an endeavor. And actually, there must be quite similar um, initiatives here, and I'm pretty sure Prof. Quenum uh, will later in this week introduce those. Um, so the question here then is, um, what, what do we actually call a high-performance computer? And I just want to run you briefly. I'm pretty sure you all know what a laptop is. I'm sorry for the picture quality. Um, I'm pretty sure you all know what a desktop computer is. And you notice I'm just going up a little. Um, you have heard of the word server that is very many different interpretations of the wording. Um, you can also put it upside down or, or on the sideways and you can stack them on top of each other. And if we do that, we call this a rack. And um, I just brought you a picture here of one of those computing racks and I'm pretty sure, well, not pretty sure. I know that you have such racks standing here as well as us as we have them at UNAM. Um, and um, then the question is, what do you do with that? And so there's one concept which we need first, and which is that is called, or I call that remote computing. Um, and that is that, well, you have your laptop or whatever computer you're sitting on, and you actually send the job that needs to be done to a bigger machine. And at this point in time, you don't need to care about what machine it is, and you don't need to care about your laptop being still running 24 seven for the next two weeks, um, but you will get the results afterwards. So they, they, this is the very basic principle and we will all make use of that in the course of this program. Um, then there is what is called serial computing or high throughput computing. And that is if you don't just send one job to this computing farm or to this compute cluster, but you send many jobs and all of them get executed and you get um, all the different results and you get them together into one result. And one example uh, where you could do that is you want to calculate the way that each of these um, little balls can take. That's a Galton board, um, very basic statistics, um, but it's just to illustrate the idea to the next one. Um, so you can have many, many single uh, ways that you need to calculate, but each of them is not dependent on the others. So you can calculate them all in parallel. And that is what's called high throughput computing because they don't influence each other. And then there's um, a second step you can take and that's called parallel computing. And there you have essentially one job and that job requires the different parts of the job to talk to each other because they are interdependent of the different um, of the different results of the parts. And one big example of that is anything that has to do with weather forecasting or climate simulations. Because as I will show you in the uh, very next picture, um, you have very different pieces 
of your environment that have to work together and that influence each other um, in very different ways. And you need to take care of them all. I, I don't want to go into details here. I'm not an expert in that. I just want to bring, uh, briefly bring that to you as an example. I also brought you, oh, shall we try that? Maybe we'll try that. If you can, should be a video and should be clickable. Fingers crossed. Um, you might have heard here, sorry for, for the audio uh, being not top-notch quality, um, training more users, and this is literally the reason why we're here, aren't we? Um, brought you some pictures, there's actually a few more uh, computers arrived in the meantime uh, that you had seen in this little, little video. Um, oh, sorry, um, next one. Um, there's actually three stages of the high performance computer that we host at UNAM. The first, well, but all of them don't compare, like obviously and honestly, to those large scale computing infrastructures which uh, other countries um, have and spend millions and millions of, well, not man dollars, but uh, hard currency or harder currencies. Um, well, this is in Japan, so I, don't, I, can't, I can't say US dollars, right? <laughs> um, um, so, as I said, our, our, our computer at UNAM is, is, is three parted. One part is um, a donation of the previous Ranger supercomputer, which was hosted in, in, in Texas. Texas is once at the end of their lifetime, they essentially, stopped. well, as you, as, as you see here, it was many, many racks, and they split it up in several, um, several pieces. And then um, through the Center for High Performance Computing in Cape Town, they would distribute it to the ISK partner countries. Um, and I think UNAM as well as NAS received uh, one of those Ranger eggs. Um, they have well, quite, 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 quite substantial computing power uh, already. And this is our main workhorse so the, until this date. Um, I don't want to go into all these details here, but you, you see is, is these little pieces are actually the servers that we talked about previously. And you see there's quite a couple of them and the server um, has them a couple of CPUs. Um, so yes, a lot of computing power to be used. Um, the second one is also from the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, it was called Stampede when it was um, still uh, as many racks like this. I think also there, um, the SKA partner country. So you can see it's again all through the astronomy in some sense, or in preparation for the bigger astronomy projects. Um, got donated um, these uh, one, one, one computer X each. And quite recently, we also acquired a data server, which was um, uh, with the HES telescopes previously. When they upgraded their system, we made use, uh, we made sure that we get um, hold of their old um, storage equipment which is also quite substantial. Um, the setup here, as you can see, I want to go into all the details. You just click twice more and you get the nice pictures there. Um, what I want to close with is essentially a quote uh, by Honorable Lady Pandor when she visited Vintuk here in uh, 2014. And 
I don't want to read the quote to you, but essentially it says something like, well, there's, there, there's quite a couple of problems in Africa, um, and yes, we need to address them, but we shouldn't just look at the problems. We should also look at the opportunities we have, particularly in those spaces where we have some geographical advantage for small contiguous. We should really make use of that, and astronomy is one of them. And with that, Lamy, I want to thank you again, and thank you for listening, and um, yes, if you have any questions, I'm ready. So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Page, um, for that um, um, nice talk. And I also 100% agree with you. We should focus if we really want to contribute something significant to the body of knowledge. The things of human computer interaction, it's a focus of buy things on the side. We need to focus on the hard sciences and really, from a fundamental point of view, solving these challenges. And then, and like Prof. Bates also said, we, our, uh, the way we stand as Africa, geographically, we stand an opportunity, or we have an opportunity where we con can contribute significantly to the body of knowledge and to science in general. Thank you very much, Prof. Bates, for that. So next up, we'll then have uh, Dr. Eli Kasai, Eli Kasai, who will then give a talk on the introduction of machine learning. Um, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for being here with us today. We really um, appreciate you being here for uh, over an hour and listening to all this. And we know we have a lot on your plate. And uh, thank you very much. We can be there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please enjoy. Mm -hmm. OK, we are trying to sort out our next presentation. Um, please uh, stay tuned or uh, stay with us. We'll be back shortly, two minutes. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, oops. Okay, that's not what you should. Oops. All right. <clears throat> okay, thanks. All right. Sorry for the for the short delay. Uh, well, maybe it's uh, over the middle. Great. Um, yeah. Thanks, Lamek. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eli Kasai. I'm the head of department for physics, chemistry, and material science at UNAM. Um, 
I'm also a senior lecturer there in the, uh, in the School of Science, basically. Um, so I didn't have a chance to send my biography <laughs> through. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, one of those things, I was trying to send it to Lamek, but uh, uh, yeah, there were some issues there just now um, as I was seated in the audience. Anyway, um, so I was given the task of introducing uh, machine learning or giving an introduction to machine learning. Um, so as I was preparing the slides last night, I thought, hmm, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to speak about machine learning because I'm also I'm also a, uh, a physicist. I'm not from computer science. I think I can help that bottle of water. Well, then I thought to myself, oh well, um, I have done a bit of machine learning uh, in my own right. So I decided to put some slides together that I'm going to share with you um, as a way of introducing machine learning. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. I'll give a brief overview of machine learning and then a brief history. And then we will look at the, the difference between actual programming and machine learning. And then, and then we'll step on to, um, you know, how computers actually learn, and then types of machine learning approaches, and then I'll summarize. Um, so as a brief overview, machine learning is almost in everything that we are involved in at the moment. Uh, if you can think of you know, your daily lives, Netflix, you find all these things very nagging actually. Um, hey Eli, did you enjoy that movie? Um, yeah, if you enjoy that one, there are some more here. That, so recommendation systems, you know, because you sign to all these accounts, they, these softwares keep listening in and then they identify your choices and your priorities and then they keep suggesting stuff to you. That's all being done by machine learning algorithms. And then um, now, you know, machines are actually beating champions, world champions. The, the, the world champion in chess now is a computer. It's no longer a human. And not so long ago, um, I think the champion was Japanese in Go, in the game Go. A few years ago, the machine beat that champion. So this, so machines are basically becoming smarter and smarter at doing these things, and, and thanks to machine learning. Um, yeah, so you have challenges so on the one side, where are we going with all this? You know, are we going to use it for the right reason? Are, are we going to use all this uh, cleverness that's, you know, transpiring and evolving for the right reasons? So far, it seems to go that way, but one never knows. So cancer diagnosis, drug discovery, you know, uh, assisted driving, these are all uh, areas that machine learning are being applied in. Um, one such area is, you know, the Tesla cars that are developed by Elon Musk and some other companies where, you know, you have the option to actually drive the car um, uh, using machine learning algorithms. You have the option to actually, you know, uh, you know, turn it on so that it drives itself or you have control of it. So those cars are sort of semi-autonomous. This is all due to machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. Um, so I could go on, on and on talking about these things, but um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, um, point that I need to talk about. So where did all this start? Um, so if you if you do a bit of digging, you'll realize that there was a gentleman called uh, Arthur Samuel back in the 50s, late 50s. And he gave the early definition of machine learning. He said it's a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly, explicitly programmed. Um, so the same chap is also known to have written the first self-learning algorithm, okay, that basically played this game called checkers, different kinds of this 
uh, different versions of this kind of game. But he wrote an algorithm for this. And the algorithm learned, and later on, it was beating national champions that were uh, that were actually champions of this game. So that, that is seen as, as the first start of how machine learning actually came into being, or, or that marks the, he's credited for having started the field. Now, um, how is machine learning different from um, computer programming as we know, all right? So to answer that question, I'm going to use an example of the Pong game, all right, where, you know, you, you have two players, they keep the ball, keep going to each side and you have to intercept it with the bat on each side, all right? So if you don't intercept it, then the opponent gains one point and vice versa. So I'll use that analogy to try and explain um, what machine learning does. So what would happen? So if a programmer programs the pawn game so that it plays against you, then what he does is uh, as the ball crosses the boundary, goes to the other side, if the height of the, the bat is higher than the height of the ball, then the, the programmer can just write the code and say, if that is the case, then lower the bat so that it intercepts the ball, all right? And then the other way around, if the ball is higher than the bat, then the bat must go higher. And that's on each side. So, um, so that's traditional program, right? So you, you formulate a set of instructions, um, you have some data and then you basically that that constitutes a program that will give you answers the answers in this case are to keep moving the bat up and down so that it intercepts the ball all right um so what is the data so the the rules in this case are basically the if statements that the programmer writes and then the data the data could be the positions the location of the ball, its speed, the path, the location of the bat, and so forth. Okay, so those are sort of the inputs. Um, and then out comes the answers. What are the answers? The answers is the direction that the bat should be moving up and down in order to intercept the ball. So you'll play um, the pong game, all right, with those instructions designed by the programmer. With machine learning, however, um, it's the other way around. So if you notice, so we have rules on this side, but now with uh, in traditional programming, if you like, you have rules on the one side with the data, out comes the answers on the other side. With machine learning, you feed answers to the to, to the machine so that it learns. So instead of you um, writing a code to say, if the, if the height is this, if the height is that, you actually give the answers to the machine uh, so that it, it has something like this. So if the ball starts here and then the trajectory points that it will land over there, you tell the, um, actually, I'm supposed to have a video. Yeah. Oh, actually, give me a minute. I hope I won't run out of time. Uh, where is my code? I'm violating later code in the presentation. Sorry about that. Okay, so. What do I want to do? What I want to do is actually this. I think it works. I don't know why it doesn't work, um, but here it works. So with the machine learning algorithm, so you give you give the data and you give the answer. So you, you locate the position of the bat and the, the trajectory. So the answer is the bat must move up. So you give that to the machine to learn. And then you keep doing this over and over and over 
And many times the machine learns the pattern that the, the trajectory of the ball keeps moving. Um, that way, it actually, the machine ends up formulating uh, the rules or the code, all right? It, the machine ends up formulating a model. Right, so traditional programming, you give the rules, you write the code and you give the data, out comes the answers. Machine learning, the computer is given the answers and the data and it must formulate the rule or it must formulate the code. Right, um, so just as an example of, maybe let me pause there. Um, so just, just to recapture again, so this is, this is the takeaway. So those switches in traditional programming, answers come out. In machine learning, when a computer has to learn how to do the problem or how to, or, or how to look for patterns, it ends up developing the model the rules. We sometimes refer to that as a model, right? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, take an example of how we can actually uh, use machine learning uh, to sort of predict what the, the slope and the y-intercept should be. So this is linear regression. Um, it's one of the uh, common um, examples that I used in, you know, in demonstration of, 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 of how machine, a machine actually learns. We know how to do this. In the lab, you know, we've seen these kinds of things. We're, I'm sure we're all scientists here. We must have done some first year physics, uh, even in high school, uh, hopefully for the most part. So we can work out what the slope is. So we know the answer to this problem, but that's not the, the point. The point is to train the machine to be able to do this. We, we don't want to do this. We, we know how to do it, but we need to train an algorithm so that it knows how to do it. Um, so how do we solve this problem? So we have a line that is governed by y equals mxc, in this case, using machine learning terminologies. Uh, w is the weight, b is the bias, uh, which are synonymous with the gradient in the y-intercept. Now, how do we go about solving this? How do we figure out what w should be and what b should be? So if I was to do this, I will start making some guesses. So I'll take a look at when X is equal minus two, Y is minus five, and when X is minus one, Y is minus three, and so forth. So I have some, I have some ideas of how to get Y from X. But for me to get Y, I need the value of W and B, okay? So and I need the machine to actually know how to do that. So I could start by taking some guesses. I could say, um, Maybe y is equal to 5x plus 5. And then, and then I run that using the x values. And I find that I'm completely off. You know, my estimate, my guess is, is wrong. All right. So then I try again, you know, y equals 2x plus 2. And then I still see that I'm actually still off, but not as bad as the first time. So I keep doing this, and then later on. I will actually figure out in the end, just by trial and error, that W is two and B equals minus one. But I knew that answer. I keep comparing my answer to the, or my guesses to what I get. So what I do is I subtract my predictions from the true values, all right? So I keep doing that until eventually I, I determine or I establish that W is two and B is minus one. If you do that, that's exactly how a machine learns. So it'll start with a guess. And then um, this, is, this is an example of supervised learning actually. It'll start with, with a guess and then it, it, it outputs a model and then it compares that model or the solution or the, the rules using the analogy that I was using earlier on to the true value. And then it checks, am I off? It evaluates what's called the loss function or the cost function. If it's completely off, then it, it keeps doing that. It keeps on doing that over, over and over and over again. 
And then eventually it shrinks the difference between the true value and, uh, and its predictions and then it, it knows. But through that whole process, it discovers so many things, so many patterns that you and I will not be able to discover, all right? A programmer is not able to do what a, uh, a machine learning can uncover through that whole process because it can do it in really a short amount of time compared to, you know, an ordinary, what an ordinary programmer can do. Right, so, um, so that's exactly um, what basically what happens. So what I've done is I've taken one neuron, okay? I've taken one neuron and I did the prediction for um, the y-intercept or the, the weight and the bias. So that's just one neuron. The idea is we want to train a computer or we want the computer to learn how to think like a human, all right? So that's exactly, this is a representation of a neuron in our brain. One neuron in our brain is, uh, this is an artist impression of that. So it takes inputs and it gives outputs. So here you give it an input, input is X, but it needs to know what W and B should be for it to get Y. So it will keep tri the trial and error period until it learns what W and B should be. But that's for the case of a, of fitting for those two parameters in a uh, linear function, right? Which is really not that complicated, right? But uh, problems that we face, that face humanity, that we sit with in many disciplines are not linear. They are highly unlinear and they are more complicated. And for that reason, we need more neurons. This is where the concept of our neural network comes in. We need more neurons if we are to treat, you know, if we are to analyze complex problems. All right. So what you will have is something like this. This is modeled on the fact that this is how the brain works. All right. So this is again an artistic impression of what the brain looks like, uh, what the brain is supposed to look like. And these neurons are connected to each other like that. It's actually an app that you can sort of move these neurons around and make connections and you can see how information flows in the network. Um, so that's what, um, you know, the artificial neural network is based on, which is the core of machine learning, all right? So with machine learning, we're trying to reproduce, you know, how the brain works. We have a biological neural network here, which is a depiction of our brains. And we want to produce something similar, these artificial neural networks. So each one of these neurons predicts some underlying parameters of the rules that it needs to produce. So you give it inputs. Uh, for a set of inputs, we want an output. So we, we train the model or we, we train the, the machine or the computer so that it gives us the set of outputs for, uh, give us the desired outputs for the set of inputs that we give it. So this is how the one neuron will do its prediction and passes on its result to the next one. So these are actually called layers. So for cases where you have to deal with, oops, okay, uh, one slide is missing. Um, these are actually called layers. For cases where you need to do face recognition, um, you need to recognize whether this object is a cat or a dog and things like that, you need a whole lot of these kinds of uh, neurons in what are called layers. The output of one layer gets fed into, the, into uh, the next layer and so forth until you get the desired outcome. So what you do is you give the desired outcome to the network and then it must tune each each of these neurons must must uh, predict uh, must learn what the parameters should be to give that outcome. So they know what outcome they're looking for. So they look at the input data, each one of them, and then uh, the whole network basically demands from each neuron to produce parameters or so predicted parameters that match the output. Okay, I think I'm gonna present from my data, if you don't mind. 
which time do I still for? Damik? Sorry. How much time do I still have? Oh, okay. All right, that's better. Okay. Um, so, oh, looks like it really disappeared. Anyway, um, okay, let's go back to PDF. Sorry? Right? No. <laughs> um, looks like it got displaced completely. Right. Uh, so, what else did I want to say? Uh, I think I think we will just we'll just leave it at that. Um, I really did not know how how deep I needed to go, but I, I hope that this can give you some impression of the difference between programming as we know it and machine learning. All right. Um, so just to summarize, this is a rapidly developing field, and it's central to many of our processes, whether it's science social health, you name it, right? Entertainment, recommendations. Uh, so I think that we need active participation in this. Uh, there's, there's so much benefit from us being actively involved in this because a lot of the challenges that we face um, can actually, machine learning can, can help us address those. So I think you know locally and internationally we need to actually just strengthen our participation in this, and we need to synergize as uh, Nast and Yunam actually because uh, we operating in different spaces. But uh, um, you know I hope that this conference is is you know one of those efforts that can actually you know strengthen uh, us working together because I think we are powerhouses of you know, producing knowledge, but I'm not, I'm just not sure if we're doing enough. And I think that, you know, a platform like this, it's one of those that we just need to kickstart these processes and synergize more to share best practices. And um, we also just need to intensify efforts with international partners because um, there's, there's, there's a lot that we can do together, actually. Okay, thank you very much. So into the talk. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, standing in for Dr. Lamek. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kasai, for that insightful presentation. Ah, am I not audible enough? Okay. Right. Um, could be standing in for Dr. Lamek. Um, My name is Herman Kanjimi. I'm part of the Faculty of Computing uh, in the Department of Computer Science. Um, my task is to quickly call upon the next speaker, who is our Acting Executive Dean, Prof. Fungai, to quickly um, give us a vote of thanks and then we can have a quick picture outside and then have our tea. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So as we produced, my name is Fungai Dubushara, and my task this morning is to give a vote of thanks to all of you. So uh, allow me, Director of Ceremonies in absentia, Dr. Lamaka Mkongo, to thank you for the uh, job well done in directing the ceremony this morning, and to the Assistant uh, Director, Mr. Elman Kanjimi, thank you for this opportunity, and it's a Warm um, morning for us. Uh, Happy New Year at NAS. Would like to thank you, our delegates, for taking time to come and uh, learn more about uh, data science during this long week. 
We are hopeful and uh, excited that when you finish this week, you would have uh, come up with the solutions that were promised. And uh, as I was listening to the two uh, keynote speakers, I was really excited by the amount of data that they were promising is available for manipulation and the algorithms that were presented. I see someone was even busy coding, the source code was there being compiled and running. So I don't know whether it's intimidating for the participants or it's actually exciting to know that you are going to be uh, following the footsteps of the great uh, physicists and uh, oh, both of them are physicists by the, by the way. So, and computer scientists who are manipulating the data. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank the uh, speakers for the day. We have online Dr. Eliana Os uh, Osorio from the University of Manchester. who will take the first session uh, after the break, as well as uh, Dr. Salapi uh, from the University of Sterling. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come and uh, educate our local capacity in Namibia. We really appreciate that. I would also like to uh, thank our partners in sponsoring this event. We have the Sarao in South Africa. We have the United Kingdom uh, Science and uh, Innovation Department, who are also part of the uh, sponsors of this event. And of course, our dedicated organizers who have been running around through the weeks and making sure that everything is happening. I'm too surprised that Lame could afford to put on a suit today because for the past couple of weeks he was in shorts and slippers uh, running around making sure that he goes uh, on. Uh, Prof. Kenam hiding behind and the other team members that I can see in the room. Thank you so much for the great work that you did. I see the Swama uh, Tamiela. Thank you, uh, Miss Ipinke. I saw you walking in at some point. But anyway, thank you to all the organizers. Even if I did not mention your name. We really appreciate the good work that you put into making this happen. And we believe that you are continuing to, uh, you are going to continue working hard towards the success of the event. And I would like to uh, thank Dr. Eli Kasai for taking time to be with us today and teaching us machine learning. I learned a lot. I didn't know about supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And I didn't know that the computers could actually learn from a solution that was uh, already predefined uh, through trial and error like me and even become smarter than the human beings that are doing that. Thank you so much for that education session. And I heard you say that you are not doing that, but when I looked at the screens that were popping there and what you're busy modeling with that little knowledge that you have, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. And to our esteemed professor in astronomy, thank you so much for uh, enlightening us on the relationship between physics, uh, computer science, big data, and all the other sciences that we have. You know, when we are in a specific field, we usually tend to look at your own field in isolation of the others. And sometimes we use the math to understand the relationship between the different things. And that was quite, uh, interested to see how you brought them together and how you position yourself as a, uh, as a physicist within the bigger picture of data science. And your passion for the HPC computers was well demonstrated. I believe that you can step out of your physics um, shoes some day and come and work on the uh, HPCs to model the, the uh, different uh, models that we need to solve the problems that we have. And provide that uh, accelerated uh, algorithm that can process those two terabytes that you showed us at the beginning of your presentation. So thank you so much. And a special thank you to our vice chancellor for taking time uh, to come and grace this occasion to uh, welcome the participants on board and for your keen interest in the development that we are having here. I hope that. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor say you'll be here on Friday to witness the solutions that have been promised by these uh, participants at the end of their uh, journey. And to all the NAS management, to the uh, colleagues that uh, give us support, we want to thank you 
And for our participants, we wish you a very fruitful week. Thank you for taking time to be here. And before I step off, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Colin Stanley to come to the podium and help me thank our speakers. Dr. Stanley. First, I'll call the last speaker, Dr. Eli Kasai. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor Bex, please come to the podium. And thank you to our TBC for handing out the gifts. Over to you, MC. Well, um, thank you very much um, to my boss. <laughs> I think um, executive, um, executive Dean for the Faculty of Computing and Mathematics, and also to our acting DVC for this safety innovation and partnership, Dr. Colin Stanley. And um, yeah, before we go on a break, um, we would just like to tell those who are actually following online that we are going to resume um, exactly after 30 minutes. Uh, so now we are going to have a tea break, but before the tea break, it would be nice if we can just take a nice uh, uh, big family picture outside. And um, yeah, we can do that now. To be good. And then we can continue after 30 minutes. I saw how you did just yesterday. Thank you for I can see the key gates and make what First of all, this is our Well, first of all, I managed to, you know, I'm a second, second. Our skin is Yeah, I'm going to go to the next 
Okay, okay, okay. I need to push you the phone. Oh, really? <laughs> then just I don't know. I need to. I need to um, speak to Vanessa. Yeah, 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 we were we're trying to do our part here. You you were not just on the yes point. Although it's mainly tonight, but that feels still quite a from it. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it's quite. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. well, most of the people that have trained, for example, astronomy and other things, they get absorbed yeah. because of the skill they learn. Yeah. 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 But anyways, next is online, so yeah, it's fine. Yeah.
Can you, um, if you think, can you email some of the pictures to uh, Lindsay? I will send you the
Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you also hear me? Yeah, we can hear you right then. Are you able to um to see if you can um share your screen? Yes. Wait a minute, just give me a minute. I think I need to. Um, okay, I would have to reconnect again. Okay, so try reconnecting again. Okay, I've made you co-host. Are you able to connect now? Yes, I should be able to connect now. Should be able to share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Okay. Perfect. I think you, you can just leave it on and then we'll be back in um, exactly uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Well, I I I'll, I'll I'll stop the screen sharing for now. I just I just want to check some few things and then I'll share it again right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, is that so? Can I just share this link? Is this the link that because uh, I have a colleague who wants to watch as well, and so yeah, share that link. But it's also available on the on the on the YouTube. Okay. All right. I will let me so send I mean you the, the the live stream link. Yeah, I will send you the live stream link on YouTube. Okay. All right. Okay.
Eddie. Yes, can I share my screen now? So is it 11.15? Yeah, but I think we'll start earlier so that we just have more time. Okay. Yeah, I think we can just already say, um, then we see if, uh, also test if the people on YouTube can see your screen. Okay. Let me just check. You can see your, your screen on YouTube. Yes, we can see your screen on YouTube as well. That's perfect. Um, Eddie? Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, I'll just tell you when you can start. Okay, all right. So should I leave my screen shared? Just leave your screen like this. Okay, all right. Um, welcome back from the tea break. Um, we'll be starting shortly. Um, let just wait for two more minutes for everyone to get into the room. Okay, um, I think we can get started now. So now we are in the second session of, um, of our uh, data science pool. So our next talks are going to be on application of data science in two very important areas, one in agriculture, then followed by another presentation on data science in healthcare. So the first speaker, um, uh, who is going to then present um, 
or to give a talk on application of data science in agriculture is Dr. Edward Salapi. Uh, Dr. Edward Salapi is uh, all the PhD um, from the University of Sus Sussex. Um, and for his PhD, he worked on S observation using uh, uh, remote sensing data. Um, so he's currently uh, a postdoc uh, fellow or a research scientist uh, at the University of Stirling um, in Scotland, UK. Um, and um, his work involves remote sensing um, using machine learning and uh, big data technology on, on Earth observation data. And he is then going to enlighten us how one can then apply data science techniques um, um, in agriculture to then solve some of the important things such as drought and uh, overgrazing and things like that. So, Dr. Salatri, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you also hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. All right. So, um, I think uh, you can now start with your presentation. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lomek. Um, Thank you for the opportunity actually given me to actually come and speak on this platform as well. Um, it's actually a great honor to come and speak here. So um, like Dr. Lamek said, my name is Edward Salakpi. I hold a PhD from the University of Sussex uh, in earth observation or remote science, remote sensing um, for drought modeling and also for drought forecasting. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about the applications of data science in agriculture. But uh, prior to that, let me just give you some brief background that I'm currently a data or say at observation data scientist at the University of Stirling, working on a project called the Fort Environmental Resilience Array uh, within the Scotland's International Environment Center, where we basically try to use at observation data and also some ground data to create uh, products for to help monitor the environment more, more effectively or even provide information to industries that can help them you know take more make more green decisions in their in their manufacturing or even in their in their service delivery so basically that is what i do now but then for today i'll be talking to you mainly about how you can apply data science in the field of agriculture so uh, by way of outline i'll be touching a bit on you know data science in the in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I'll talk about a concept I'm sure most of you have heard, or those, who, those who've not heard maybe be learning about it for the first time called datafication. And then we'll look at its role in, um, in, the, in the current you know, fourth industrial revolution. And then we'll talk about modern agriculture, how modern agriculture has taken advantage of this datafication. And then we move on to the main talk for today, which is data science and agriculture. We are look, we're going to look at how we can use data that has been collected from ground sensors for, you know, to uh, enhance agriculture and then also look at how data from earth observation is also helping. And then, uh, yeah, so with all this, I'll also give some, you know, practical use cases, uh, including some of the projects that I've been working on and other future projects that are, are in the pipeline. So, um, Fourth Industrial Revolution, what is this all about? Well, you would agree with me that in, in modern times, you are seeing that a lot of industries, a lot of service delivery, a lot of manufacturing firms are being driven by digital technology. And so um, to, make, to make their process more efficient or to make it more cost-effective, people are migrating to the cloud, people are using you know, internet of things, people are using automated systems, robots and things to guide or, you know, to inform their decision or even aid their production and also aid their profit. And throughout all this, one of the main things we see is that data is like the main force behind everything that we are seeing now. Data is like the fuel that is driving everything. And agricultural science is, not, is no exception to this because for all of us to actually live and survive on this earth, we all, we all need food. And agriculture is like the main source of food that we all get as, as people. And so uh, agriculture science cannot be left out. And so because of that, people have tried to find ways, you know, to 
rope in agricultural science into this whole fourth industrial revol revolution. And so um, the question then is then how, you know, what from what we know, agriculture is mainly from what we learn from school or what we know is that it's mainly about some farmers putting some seed into the ground, watering it, it grows, they harvest, and then they go and sell on the markets. But then, so pe people usually find it difficult to see where data science comes in. I mean, where do the data come from? You know, how do we create data? How do we assess data? You know, to actually drive this digital revolution, especially in agriculture, because people don't see where data can come from in terms of people just planting, watering, and then harvesting. But then there's this concept called datafication. And this is what is actually helping people to bring or convert you know, some of the things we do in our daily lives into data. So what's datafication? Basically, it's a process of transforming our everyday lives, you know, aspects of our life into digital data. For, for instance, um, I mean, who, who ever thought that even using a digital camera and taking some pictures with a digital camera, you can now just take that picture, get some data from that picture and use it to make, you know, build system that will make predictions and build system that will help, you know, identify things. There's all datafication. Now people wear smart watches. In those days, we just walk or, you know, run or ride our bicycles and exercise with the, with the aim of, you know, living a healthy life. But with now, with this smart watches and with all the smart devices, we are able to convert our daily lives into data. So, you know, you can collect your sleeping, you can collect data on your sleeping pattern, you can collect data on your walk, your run, your bicycle ride, and all those things. And this is all thanks to the application. And bringing this into the field of agriculture, this has actually enabled the practice of data science in agriculture. But then how, how has this been achieved? I mean, how has, how has agriculture been roped in or how has data been roped in into you know, the whole field of agriculture? And there, there are a few farming practices that people are doing in this modern time that has enabled you know, the production or maybe the, the generation of data that people are now using in data science. And a few of those you know, modern agricultural technologies are one of the main things now that you hear, the main thing that you hear people talk about these days is precision agriculture. You know, precision agriculture is one of those farming practices where, where just people just, you know, going into the farm to plant their seeds and harvest, it's becoming a thing of the past. People are now interested in measuring some, you know, aspects of this process. And so then they have, they now have instruments that they now fix in the fields and also have drones that they fly to take images they, are, they now have probes that they fix into the soil to get, you know, soil moisture. And then they have this other IoT devices that they fix on all aspects of the farms. And then what this enables them to do is to collect data, you know, daily data on soil moisture levels, daily data on, you know, even water uptake, how well the plants are using water. They're able to collect all that. How well the plants are taking up fertilizer, you know, the fertilizer need of the plant. How well, you know, uh, they are using the pesticide. Do the plants even need to use pesticides because... This pesticide, you know, some of them just leave residue in the plants and, you know, it affects consumers. And so with datafication now, with all these instrumentations on the field, you're able to measure all these things via precision uh, agriculture. Another way where people are actually taking advantage of collecting data in agriculture is, the, is this new phenomenon uh, of vertical farming, where instead of, you know, growing plants in the field, people actually just have some big warehouses or some big greenhouses where they stack layers of crops on each other and then, you know, grow crops in a very controlled environment. Some, some even recently, even if you watch TV, you see that even in some areas like in Paris, people are now growing things on, in urban areas on top of buildings and all that. And what this does is that with, within this controlled environment, people are able to fix senses, fix instruments that measure, you know, the plant activities. And so all this does is that it all generates data that people can use to actually study plants, study how plants are responding to their environment, and then use that for a whole lot of analysis to help, you know, to bring data science basically into agriculture so that, so that agriculture doesn't lose out on this fourth industrial revolution. revolution. So uh, what are some of the use cases when, when you, know, you get the data from all the senses? One of the main things that you see people do or smart farms are doing now is to create dashboards. And so all the sensors that are all the sensors that you see on the 
on the fields and the farms, they are connected to some form of a dashboard. And so you can, you know, have a real time monitoring of every aspect of your crop in the field. So, and what this enabled them to do is that apart from just having this dashboard that they could actually have a real time inflow of data and to see the activities, they're able to also use the data to actually monitor and accurately predict what are needs of the plants. So they know that, okay, today the plant needs just this amount of water. So they don't waste so much water on the field. They know that, you know, the plant needs this, just this amount, this right amount of uh, nutrient or this right amount of fertilizer. So they don't give too much fertilizer to the plants. And so data is helping with decision here. And so that is basically data science being practiced in the field of agriculture. Also, um, it also helped them to anticipate, you know, nutrient deficiency. So they can see whenever the plant is, it's, it's uh, being affected by, you know, some disease or some, you know, some physical defect based due to, you know, the deficiency of some nutrients in the plant. And so they're able to now supplement that and give not even plant, but even, even in animal farming as well. People are able to, you know, anticipate some of these things and also give the animals the required, you know, food and, you know, the ration they need. Also, um, with, with the data, with the data available now, people are able to forecast into the future. So, you know, some of this uh, biotic or abiotic, so when I say biotic, you know, stresses that are caused by animals or living organisms, and then abiotic stresses, stresses that are caused by, you know, other things that are not, that are not living, like for instance, drought or climate, those are those abiotic stresses. And so then if you're able to collect data on all these things, then you can see that, okay, if in the past, this amount of water and this amount of pesticide application affected the crop in this way, then you know they can put them in some models and also make predictions that okay in the future, if I give this maybe two weeks ago, then in the future my plant is likely to do this. Or if I if I reduce this particular, you know, input, then it might affect the plant negatively. It might affect the plant positively. And so they're able to forecast. And then also one area that data is helping is to actually predict or even analyze yield potential. So you know that last year we used. I mean, this, these are things that farmers usually do in the past with their, you know, in their mind, because, you know, um, some of them are experienced. So right in their head, they're able to calculate that, okay, last year, I used this amount of fertilizer, I used this amount of pesticide, and this is the yield I got. So next year, if I use this amount, I'm going to get this yield. People usually do that in their head. But then for now, with, with very large farms and, you know, very people farming over very large areas, it becomes difficult to make those calculations of, of head. And so, you know, the data aspect of it helps you to actually easily analyze your yield potential, know that, okay, this year, this is what I did and this is the yield I got. And so you can actually project into the future based on some data that you have. So those are some of the use cases of, of data science using census. But then when we move into, we can also move into another aspect of it because it's not, it's not only, you know, census that are on the field, but then we can also look at things in the, in the, uh, in the aspect of earth observation. Now, earth observation is basically, we have this big, you can think of it as big cameras in the sky, just taking pictures of the earth, right? And this also provides an avenue of data for us to actually apply data science and agriculture. So we've looked at identification by census. Now we are looking at it in terms of earth observation. Now this earth observation, um, data sets form part of what they call the big data because we have the earth, you can, you can imagine the size of the earth and you can imagine pictures being taken by these instruments, right? And the pictures are taken over large areas and over some time. And so you have data coming in daily or weekly or, you know, bi-weekly. So you have this data coming in. So what you can do is that if, if you're interested in a particular area, you can look at that area and then plot a time series of that particular area and then look at how things are changing over time, as you can see in the, in the slide here. So that is another source of data that is coming in and we can use that for, for to monitor things in, 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 the, in the aspect of agriculture. Now, let me just dive a little bit deeper into earth observation for those of you who might not have an idea of what it is. So um, as you can see in the animation in the screen, you can see this is so this just basically shows how you know this earth observation data sets are being captured. So these satellites are in space moving 
and on a daily basis or on a monthly basis or on a bi-weekly basis, taking images of the earth. And so what happens is that then we have, you know, a huge amount of data that is being produced or captured almost every time. And this gives us, you know, a rich repository of data that we can use to actually monitor a lot of things, not just agriculture, but then, you know, in the field of agriculture also gives us some data to use. And so because earth observation cuts across many fields, you know, people are using it in in uh, drought monitoring, people are using it in minerals, people are using it in uh, climate change and all that. But then for agriculture also, it gives us some good enough data to also use to study things pertaining to farming and agri. But then this data sets, one interesting thing about this is that unlike your phone cameras that just captures you know, images in three colors, the red, blue, and the green color, these uh, instruments in space actually are able to capture images along even a wider in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so, so it, they, they can capture data in the images in the red, blue, and green, which is what we usually see with our eyes. But then they can also go ahead and also, they also have you know, instruments that enable them to capture images in various other wave bands or wavelengths, like you know, the infrared and also microwave as well. And so anytime you, you go and acquire some of these data sets, instead of having just one image or just having images, maybe red, blue, green, you have images coming, you have a set of a data set that comes with minimum seven bands, maximum about 35, 40 bands. We even have the hyperspectral images that come with hundreds of bands. And so what this enables you to do is that if you're interested in a particular aspect of the edge surface, then you combine those bands that you know bring out more information for you to use. And then you can look at that, that information becomes clearer when you combine those bands. And so let me just give you a typical example of how this is done in the field of vegetation or agriculture, for instance. So you have your images that come in bands. If, if, maybe, if maybe a particular part of your image is where your plants are, and you put, and you try to just you know, sample data in that particular point across all the bands, you can generate a plot like this. And here, this green line here shows you know, vegetation and how vegetation is being reflected in all these images. And so one thing you can see is that for vegetation, the, the, the wavelengths, you know, like I said, range from visible near infrared to intermediate infrared, short wave infrared, you know, mid infrared and all that. If you look at a pixel, if you look at a pixel within the image that represents a vegetation or crop or plant or something on the, on the ground, you can see that in the visible spectrum, there is there is less reflection, so you don't get you don't get the pictures reflecting a lot of light because that is how you know cameras capture images is based on the light that is being reflected. That is what the cameras capture, and so you can see that in the in the green in the blue green and red light is not a lot of light is not reflected. This is because a lot of those lights is absorbed by the plants, and these lights are absorbed by the plants to use for photosynthesis. If, if you remember your basic science from high school, you know what photosynthesis is, you know that uses light. And so a lot of those light is absorbed. And so if, if you take the blue, green, or red band, for instance, you will not be able to see plants in those images that you're interested in. But interestingly, if you move away from the visible and you go to the near infrared, you see that there's a high reflection of, of you know, vegetation in the near infrared. And so what this enables us to do is that if you want to actually study plants using satellite earth observation data, then our band of choice is the near infrared. But then also you see that within the red also, there's some form of you know, high reflectance because the red band, the red color is one of those colors that are not you know, absorbed by the plants during photosynthesis, usually the blue and the green. And so you see there's some reflection, but then the highest reflection is seen in in the near infrared. And so if you wanted to study vegetation or crops or whatever it is, then your interest here is to look at the near infrared and the red band. And so there's this index, very popular index in earth observation called the normalized different vegetation index or the NDVI. And basically tells you how stressed you know, a plant is given some satellite image. So if, if the plant is healthy, then you have a high reflection of near infrared and then a very low reflection of red, you know, the red band. If the plant is not healthy, then 
or stressed, you see that there's a there's a somewhat higher reflection in the red and a low reflection in the near infrared. So if you put the red band and the near infrared band into this formula here, you derive what they call the NDVI. And the NDVI basically tells you that plant at a particular aspect or a particular point on the earth is healthy or not healthy. And that is one of the ways, you know, data from, we are using, you know, just pixel information. So now we are converting pixel information to useful data and to useful information that we can use to actually monitor agricultural activities on the, on the ground. And that is data science being applied in the field of agriculture or any other field that has to do with vegetation stress. And so now, so if, if you are able to now collect this NDVI, for instance, over time, then um, well, one thing I also needed, I wanted to touch on is that what I showed over here are just reflectance images or reflectance data. So, you know, whenever you capture the images and they convert them to reflectances, um, those pixels, the pixels that make up the image are usually called reflectances. So you just, you just basically how much light is being, you know, captured by the camera. Other data that you can get from satellite Earth observation include, you know, rainfall. You can also capture rainfall from satellite Earth observation. With the, with the use of another form of satellite Earth observation called the radar satellite Earth observation, you can actually also capture soil moisture. And then some of these satellite Earth observation instruments also have what they call the thermal instruments. And they're able to capture images also in the thermal band. And so you're able to get land surface temperature as well. And so what you can then do with this is that if you want to actually study vegetation on the ground or study, or you're interested in agriculture science, then you can actually use all the satellite data sets that are also available to actually study that. So uh, for instance, for my PhD research, I worked on Kenya. I was trying to look at how we can um, predict drought in uh, grasslands or grass fields, right? For pastoralists or animal farmers, because what usually what we want to, what we want to achieve here is that um, because of drought, because of persistent drought and persistent recurrence of drought, anytime the farmers take their animal out to graze, they get to a certain place and the grass over there is dry and they are not able to feed the animals. And so, and they don't have any proper information system in place to tell them that, okay, this part that you want to take your animal to, maybe there's no grass, but rather take them to this particular other aspect where, you know, there's enough grass to feed them. And so what, what so that was the premise one of the premise for, our, for my PhD uh, research. So I was trying to see if I can harness, you know, all this satellite information, process the data, come up with a time series of, you know, images. And then if I pick a point, I'm able to see if I can look at how vegetation is changing a long time. And then once I'm able to study the, those changes, I'm, I'm able to pick up change points and then also I'm able to actually predict or forecast whether vegetation condition is going to change in the future based on some past activities or not. And so uh, we used um, another, so just like the NDVI that I explained earlier on, there's another index called the Vegetation Condition Index, which is actually based on the NDVI, where you compare NDVI at a particular point in time to the maximum and minimum NDVI over time. And then you're able to calculate what they call the VCI. And the VCI is, is a popularly known um, agricultural drought indicator. And so what we did in this work was to, so this is just a schema showing how we try to focus, you know, VCI to inform farmers that, you know, vegetation, the vegetation in this particular area might be stressed in a particular point in time. And so don't send your animals over there. So what we did was to study the trends in the past data and then once you're able to learn those trends in the past data and how you know each data point relates to each other or correlates to each other, then you're able to make some extrapolation or make some forecast into the future to see how well to, to see you know how based on the past data we can forecast you know the VCIF in the future. And so this is actually a typical result of, of that. And we actually created a dashboard that is being used in Kenya by some of the drought monitoring agencies in Kenya to actually monitor drought. And so what they do is at every point in time, they take, they take whatever satellite data that is made available or that is available at a particular point in time. 
And then we, we learn the patterns in that data. Then we make some predictions and then also calculate the errors on those predictions as well. And then that goes to inform the drought management agencies as to when there's going to be a drought or not. And then they can actually, based on some trigger or certain alarm, they're able to now reach out to the farmers and help them you know, overcome the stresses of drought and you know, vegetation condition, low uh, vegetation stress in, in, the, in their regions. Another thing we did with, or another thing I did, so in the third chapter of my thesis, I actually tried to use what they call the hierarchical Bayesian model to provide, you know, differentiated drought forecasts within any given region of interest. Because one thing we notice is that if you take a particular region of interest in Kenya, you're seeing that if you, if you maybe focus on only the agroecological zone, those are the zones that have similar climate, similar soil type, you know, similar vegetation type. You see that you take a particular county within Kenya and there is there are different agroecological zones. So if you take this whole county in the northern part of Kenya, for instance, you see that it has a very arid zone. Within that county, we have some semi-arid and then we have some humid zones as well. And so if you wanted to forecast drought in this area, for instance, it won't be advisable to just take all the pixel values of your map or your satellite images here and then put that into a model and predict. You should be able to build a model that can predict a different drought in the very arid, predict a different you know, drought condition in the semi-arid and also the, you know, the arid or the humid areas. And so what I did was to use a hierarchical Bayesian model to actually differentiate you know, the different effects of environmental you know, conditions on the VCI and then try and predict VCI for the various, for the different agroecological zones. Now I did that for also the different type of land covers as well. And so here we are seeing results of, um, we are seeing um, R squared, that's basically looking at how well the model performed when it, when it came to forecasting up to 12 weeks ahead. And so you can see that at four weeks ahead, we are having R square values of, at four weeks ahead, we are having R square values close to about almost 90%. And then as you move ahead, as expected, the performance drop. But then what you can see that as at about, as about eight weeks, we still have predictions or forecasts that are saying that, well, the model is predicting, you know, very accurately the VCI at eight weeks and even 10 weeks, because we are still, if, if you decide to even put a threshold at 70%, you're seeing that your model is doing very well up to about 10 weeks in four for some, for some uh, agroecological zones and then for some land covers. So, so the important thing we wanted to point out here is that you could see that, yeah, the model is predicting very well for the very arid regions compared to the other arid regions, co compared to the other, you know, agroecological zones. And this is what we wanted to, this is the message we wanted to send that, you know, for the very arid regions where, uh, where we have, you know, people, where we have the environment prone to frequent drought, we are able to build a model that is able to separate the other agroecological zones and all actually forecast and say that, okay, for the very arid zones where there are frequent drought occurrences, we are able to actually forecast VCI for them. And this is one of the use cases of, you know, data science for effective agricultural um, decision-making and also, you know, management. Now, moving away from droughts, one other thing I did during my PhD was actually to use the same satellite earth observation data sets to actually map out banana plantations. So the idea here was that um, banana plants are asexual, means that you know they actually do not do not have that male female kind of relationship. So you don't have a male plant crossing a female to produce the fruits. The one plant has this has both you know sexual organs and is able to produce the fruits. And so what happens is that this makes banana are very genetically identical because you don't have a male from another species coming to cross with a female from another species or, you know, to produce. And so, so what happens is that if you have this genetically identical plants across the field, then what happens is that as soon as there's a disease on one plant, it easily spreads out and quickly affects all the other plants. And so what um, we set out to do over here was here, we were working with the University of Exeter and also working with retailers in the UK to actually see if we can use satellite earth observation to map out the banana plantations. 
And actually, it was a big project. We wanted to do that globally to see exactly to see if we can map our banana plantations, you know, across the most of across most areas where banana is produced. We did it. This was a test case in Costa Rica. And so the idea was that once we are able to now create those maps, then we can actually then have a system that it's easily, you know, monitoring banana in those in those areas that we've identified with in those maps. And then we can build this information system that would help with decision making and then also monitor and anticipate if there's going to be a disease attack and then actually quickly move to address that. And so the way we did that was that we actually had some people on the ground going to collect data and label them for us. So this is so we had ground data that okay, this is where the banana farm is. This is where the banana farm is. This is a forest. This is some water body somewhere. These are built up areas where there are houses and other, you know, concrete structures. And so once we get all those labels, then we took part of, so we actually had to train a model to actually, you know, make some predictions. So we took, we took label data from this region, for instance, trained label data. Sorry, we took label data and then we also took satellite images. Here we used both the optical and also those radar satellite images that I mentioned earlier on that used that uh, based on you know radio instead of capturing images with uh, like your phone captures this ones actually send radio waves into the head surface and then capture the backscatter and so we use those satellite images with the labels and then train some random forest classifier and also some uh, artificial neural network and then try and see if we can predict these banana plantations in areas that were not given to the were not seen by the by the model and this this is this is the result of of this this is, this is the result of those models and so if you look at the random forest classifier for instance you can see that in the area that we did not train the data on the we did not train the model on sorry the model was able to capture these banana plantations very well and also capture you know where the water bodies are capture the other, you know, forest areas. And then also capture the built up areas where the, you know, buildings and other things or you know, non, non vegetative structures or other concrete structures are. And you could also see that the neural network also did quite a good job at actually picking up exactly where the other crops were. But then also did a good job at actually differentiating other crops from the banana plantations. And so if you look at some of the results, if you look at, if you take a closer look and you separate everything as you look at the banana, you can see that in the region where, you know, we had some cluster of banana plantations, the models were able to pick up, you know, those banana plantations. What this, what, what this gives us is that even if, even if we take satellite, we take a random satellite image from a certain area where we don't know where the banana plants or banana plantations are we feed it to the model, the model should be able to give us something like this. That tells us where the banana plantations are. So now that we have, if we have something like this, then all we can do is that we can now build systems that focus on those areas where the banana plantations have been identified and then monitor them over time and then see if we can pick up any disease attack and also take actions before it happens. And so this is another use case of data science in the field of agriculture, like I've been, I've been talking about right from the start. One other thing that I'm currently doing here is, this is, this is out of agriculture, but then this is like urban tree mapping. And so, you know, we are trying to map out urban trees to actually help quantify trees in, in some urban areas right here in Scotland. And this is, this is some work that I'm currently doing. And so, and here, so uh, earlier on, the examples I showed were based on pixels. So we, we actually sample pixels and then train the model to see if they can identify the pixels. Here, what we are trying to do over here is to do a more, more of an object detection thing. And so here, we actually label the objects, give it to some deep you know, convolutional neural network model, and then try and see if the model will be able to train on the data and actually identify those objects. And so if you look at some of the results over here, we had some image here with some trees, cluster of trees over here, and we labeled them with a mask. And then when we trained the model, the model was able to predict that, you know, everything it sees in this region 
are actually trees with, with a very high precision and a very high recall. And so the idea here is that if we are able to train a model to identify trees in urban areas, then can we actually transfer that technology into the field of agriculture as well? And so one of the projects that I'm actually working on in Ghana now is, so I'm actually originally from Ghana. So one of the projects I'm working on is to see if we can use similar technologies to actually map out rice farm because rice is one of those key staples in Ghana and the government spends a lot of money importing rice into the country. Whereas we have a lot of rice farmers too in the country. So why don't we identify where the rice farms are, see if we can support them with, you know, the needed infrastructure, whatever import resources they need to see if they can boost their production and also boost their yield so that, you know, we cut down on importation of rice into the country. And so what, so the first, the, the first place to start is actually to identify where these rice farms are located all over the country. The ones we are able to find that because it will be, it will be a lot of work giving somebody a car and money to go around the country looking for rice farms. And so why don't we see if we can use satellite images to actually identify where these farms are and then see if we can build some information systems at the regional scale that will monitor this. I mean, this is just a test case of rice. We can actually you know, move this into other crops as well. And so that is another way that you know, data science with the help of satellite earth observation data has been, is going to be applied to help in agriculture. Another thing that we can also do is that we can actually also combine the two senses, right? So here, here I won't give much details here, but just to give an idea that, for instance, if you have a ground data, if you have a ground uh, sensor on a farm somewhere, and let's say maybe you want to measure ground water, water table you know, levels, the sensor, if it's located here, would only have you know, a, a less footprint. Okay, so that means you can only capture data on, on a small area where the sensor is located. But if you combine, if you combine the ground sensor with some satellite images and you're able to strike some relationship, you know, find a model that you know, links them together, like, like for instance, you take some satellite data like crop water index, which have been calculated with you know, satellite imagery using those bands that I said earlier on. Then if you're able to find that correlation between the groundwater level and the crop water index, then what happens is that if we wanted to find groundwater, you know, groundwater level that a sensor, money, a sensor uh, measured at a small area, but then wanted to find that at a very large area, then if we find that relationship, then what we can do is actually build models that would actually take this satellite data as input and also give you, you know, water table levels across a wider area based on that one sensor information that you got from a smaller area. And so that is another way we can combine, you know, data from, you know, ground sensors and satellites to actually come up with products that, you know, cover wider areas so that, you know, it, it broadens our scope and also helps us monitor things at a regional scale. And there's another also useful way that we can bring in, you know, data science into agriculture to monitor things that are useful to not only people who can afford the census, but also make it available to people elsewhere who might not have the resources to afford these expensive census on their farms. And so to conclude, um, we have seen that due to tanks of datafication, um, farmers in agriculture science as a whole has not been left out in the whole fourth industrial revolution. And uh, data science and agriculture is actually helping to do a lot of things. And some of them are, once you have this, you know, data streams coming in or you've identified the source of data and you're able to analyze them and put them into these models to, you know, get out insights or to get insights from the data, you're able to effectively manage your resources. You are actually able to manage resources in a way that would make your farm practices and agriculture practices climate smart. So, you know, we know that some of our activities on the farm, some of our activities in the fields, actually causing climate change. And so once we are able to monitor these things and effectively manage them properly, then we can be able to come up with climate smart agriculture. Now, the other thing too is all along, I've been talking about sensor, monitor environment data, monitoring, you know, the physical aspect of crops. But then scientists in the lab are also using some instruments to actually capture, you know, genetic traits of plants. And that is also a source of data that people are using.
to actually monitor or you know to actually study plant and so that's another form of datafication where people are using genomic data using dna data and what that does is that with those genomic data sets combining them with the phenotypic and then also the environmental data what they are doing is that scientists in the lab are actually develop crops that are climate smart so you know you can develop a new seed that is able to withstand some harsh weather condition is whether to grow is, is able to grow even with little uh, fertilizer or even to, even able to grow with little you know water requirements and so they're able to they can develop based on that data that they've been able to extract from the genes of the plant they can develop climate smart crops and then also you know with the data science also what it does that it helps it helps with to prevent post harvest losses because you're able to analyze your yield and you're able to analyze and know that okay this is the amount of input that I need and this is the amount of yield that I'm going to get. And so you are able to minimize post harvest losses. So you're able to harvest and sell everything that just the right amount that is required by the market. And then also with this data science, you're able to analyze and actually manage your supply chains as well. So these are some of the use cases and some of the importance of having data science in agriculture. Um, so I think that's it for now. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Lamech and uh, all of you for actually listening. And I uh, also want to thank Dara Big Data for their support. A lot of the things that I've shared over here, a lot of the things that I've learned throughout my, my studies and being able to do now, thanks to the help of Dara Big Data and the support funding and then also training from the University of Sussex and the Astrocast project. And then finally, also to University of Stirling for bringing me aboard and helping me, you know, actually do a lot of the things that I've learned and actually also learn more so that I can actually go and change a lot of things around at home and even here or even the world as a whole. And so I want to thank everyone and also thank Lamek. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, um, Dr. Salafi, for that uh, very, very important um, presentation and insightful indeed. There are a lot of questions uh, in the room. So, um, Emily, can you just help with the question? Um, morning, everyone. My question is why data science and not GIS? Because the application here, most of these things can be done with GIS, especially the NDVI and the prediction. This thing can be done either in NV or ArcGIS Pro, even admin. So why data science and not GIS? So GIS is, well, so the, the problem here is that would, would GIS give you the data that you need to actually analyze trends? Because the data that we need to actually analyze trends are from these satellite images. Well, I, I, don't, I don't get your question. That is, I don't see, because GIS and Earth observation are two different things. The global information system is just giving you some information as to where to locate something and you know where to where to move to or you know where to find a particular object. But then to actually get some data that you can use to actually look at trends, then you need to fall into you need to fall onto some systems like the Earth observation data set because that is what enables you to actually take those image bands, take those electromagnetic spectrum and then calculate whatever index that you need to calculate the things that would help you quantify things you want to study on the ground and also make decisions. So I think GIS in this case is, is a whole different thing when it, compared to what, what, we are do, what, what I'm talking about here. Okay, um, yeah, next question. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. well, I'm, not, I'm not saying that GIS is not important because you have to combine the two of them. Once you have your data as well, you need to, once you have your Earth observation data sets, you need to actually, you know, have some background knowledge in GIS 
to be able to actually process those data sets, find exactly where those data sets are located on the Earth's surface. And then and you can now capture, use those pixel information to capture information. So GIS is also important. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downplaying the importance of GIS in this case. It's also very important. Um, so basically, I just want to find out because then whatever you explained there is basically what a GIS doesn't really do using supervised classification. So with that, you are able to also uh, create signature files, which are just training files, and then you can tabulate your changes, create a computer matrix, and then do the accuracy assessment and all that. So that's why I wanted to find out why data science and not right. just using the GIS methodology. Mm -hmm. But what techniques will you then be using? Remember, oh, you remember you have data and you have live data. You use one of the data science techniques, but even when you're talking about supervised, of course, you're talking about machine learning, right? Yeah. But then I'm, I'm just like, why are you doing this? So, no, so what, what, what I want to ask here is that, what do you mean by GIS? Let me just understand what you mean by GIS in the first place. Just the remote sensing part of GIS? Yes, yeah, so it's the same thing I'm, I'm talking about. The remote sensing is what gives you these activation data sets that we are using, right? And so basically what, what I was trying to, the, the, the whole message here is that data science in agriculture. And before you start doing data science, you need, you need source of data. And in the beginning, what I tried to bring out was the fact that you know, you can get data from various sources. And one of the sources that you can get data from is remote sensing. And so once you get your data from that remote sensing or earth observation, then you can use be your GIS tools, your NV or your ArcGIS or whatever. You can use whatever tools you want because now you have your data. So now you can then apply whatever analysis you want to apply, do all your labeling, create all your, create all your maps and do all your, you know, um, come up with all your maps and every other, Confusion matrix or machine learning thing. So the thing is, how do we get the data? Once we get the data, how then do we apply it to you know get meaningful information from from the data? Does it make sense? Um, hello, uh, Mr. Edward, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you so much for the insight presentation. Um, okay, you know, we are here in Namibia and I think the data collection is actually a challenge, especially in the context of African uh, continent, uh, given the remote uh, sensing collection of data and all other methodology that you use. So I would want you to share different, since we have different researchers here at the university, probably that would want to carry out uh, research in this area. So I would want you to share some open sources where we can actually get access to the open, uh, the earth observation data, if it's possible. Or what, um, how did you gather all this data? Since um, I think in Scotland probably, it's easier to get access to this data or um, and I don't know about we, if we have the same access as Namibians uh, when we are here. So if we do, can we, can we just share uh, some of these open sources where we can find the uh, observation data that can yes, actually so. be put in uh, habitat? That's one question. Another question you mentioned on the um, data collections on the going in the field. I think it was not so clear, just for interest and learning purpose. I would want you to explain again in later what data were collected and uh, how and what instruments uh, were used for the people that you sent in the field to collect the data. Thank you. So, no, so sorry, the second, the second question again, um, which, which aspects of the talk are you talking about? Uh, you mentioned, I think I missed when you're talking about mapping, you mentioned about uh, sending some people in the field. You sent some people. Okay, to okay. Thank you. Yes, and so um, yeah, so for that for that work, basically the people in the field, what they did was just to give us maps 
you know, ground ground maps as to where, or, you know, create, first of all, they went onto the field, looked at where the banana plantations are located, gave us boundary information. So just, they just gave us boundary data or shape files to actually show where the farms are actually located on the ground. And then, so once we have those, once we had those vector labeled or boundary data sets, then those ones became labels. And so to actually be able to map, we then took satellite images. And one of the ones, one of the, some of the key satellite images we used over here were the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 image, right? And this Sentinel-2 products are optical satellite images that come in about, comes in several bands and a high resolution, about uh, the lowest 10 meter resolution images. And then we used the red band and the near infrared band of those Sentinel-2 images to actually calculate NDVI over a particular period of time that is during the growing seasons. And then we also used what they call the digital elevation maps. So these digital elevation maps were also produced by the European Space Agency as well. They have these digital uh, elevation maps. In fact, I can actually share a list of some of these sources. Some of these data sets are actually free for you to access. And uh, you'd be amazed as to the amount of data that is available for you that you don't have to pay for. And then to actually also pick up, you know, the structures on the ground. You know, the optical images will just give you some, uh, NDVI will just give you some color as to whether, you know, the plant is healthy or not at a particular point in time. But whether you want to actually pick up some physical structures of the plant, we also used what they call the synthetic aperture radar, which is the a remote sensing that is captured by radar data. And so uh, by radar satellite, sorry. So this radar satellite, instead of just, you know, taking pictures in the RGB near infrared, they actually send radio waves. And so this is, I'm talking about Sentinel-1 products. So another European Space Agency data called the Sentinel-1 products. These send radio waves and then capture the radio waves back at Baskata and then uses those Baskata information to actually produce an image. And those images are, if you process them to a certain level, are able to give you some you know, structure on the ground. And so what we did was to then take the label, take these labeled areas, capture pixels along all these data points. And so we captured where the labels were for this, the Sentinel-1 images, captured where those labeled maps or those boundary were for the digital elevation map that shows how, how a particular point on the Earth's surface is elevated compared to like in relation to the sea, to the sea level and then also take up this NDVI band from the Sentinel-2. And so those pixel information from those three satellite products were mapped to the ground label that were given us. And that is what we use to train the, the model. Um, regards to the access to the data, probably I should have added a slide that, you know, actually gave some links as to where you can actually access and download some of these data sets. But then after this talk, I'm going to make all that available to all of you so you can all have access to it because some of these data sets are free to access. Um, the other thing is that once, once you've accessed them, one other thing you need to know is how to pre-process the images to actually get exactly what it is you want from the images. And so that's another aspect. And so one thing I also add is, you know, some uh, links to where you can actually get some training on how to pre-process some of these images and, you know, derive whatever information you want from the images as well. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Salapi, for your time and really for enlightening us. I enjoyed very much, like many in the room, uh, your presentation. Another round of applause for Dr. Salapi, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was such an honor, actually, to to be invited to, to talk to, to all of you. And um, yeah, I mean, th these are exciting times. There's, there's data all over. And so, you know, you can always come up with something and think about where you can get the data and start doing some, some work. And so, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, um, uh, um, can you just stop sharing your screen? Dr. Eliana, can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. 
Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Are you, are you to share your screen? Oh, wow, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot see you, Lame. Why? Oh, because we, um, let me just, the video has been, let me Oh, um, hello, Eliana, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I still okay, cannot okay. hear you. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, it's all right. But uh, yeah. so, yes, it would be nice to say hi to everybody there. Yeah. So, hello. <laughs> they can all see you in the, on the big screen. Oh, that, yeah, that's, so, that's very comforting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our, most, our next talk is going to be given by Dr. Eliana Vasquez. Uh, Osorio, Dr. Liana Vosquez, um, a special person to me because she was uh, my supervisor, one of my supervisors for my PhD. And I have worked with her um, for three years. So we really got to know each other and established um, a good relationship. Uh, she is a senior um, research fellow at the University of Manchester. Um, and before that, she did her PhD um, uh, many years ago in, um, in the Netherlands. And her work currently um, is on the application of radiotherapy using um, a lot of data mining techniques and um, focusing on uh, image registration, dose accumulation and mapping, image processing. And although for the... Um, for the past year, she has been working in radiotherapy. She is a computer scientist, and you will be amazed how a computer scientist has become like a physicist, medical physicist, <laughs> and she is a jack of all trades. Like she is technically well-rounded. Um, so, uh, Dr. Eliana, thank you very much for um, for accepting our invitation to give a talk. The mass that Dara Dagasan School. We really appreciate your time and looking forward for your insightful presentation. Awesome. No, thank you very much, Lame. It's a honor to be here. And I mean, of course, I would love to be there to be able to see you face to face. Hopefully, it will be next time. But again, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor. So I'll share my screen. Uh, could you confirm you see it? Yes, we do see your screen. And you're seeing the, the right screen, right? Not the one with the notes. Yes, we are seeing the right one. Perfect. So, uh, hello, everybody. Um, let me, can I ask how many people is there, are there? So, um, we have 30 participants uh, participating in the school, although we have also other people online on YouTube. Okay, so, fantastic. So, we are expecting to have more people on YouTube. So, because we had 172 that applied, we only chose 30, so the rest were supposed to um, participate virtually. Wow, that, that sounds like a fantastic school. Well done, well done, Lamek. Okay, so let's go back to, to the presentation I'm going to tell, to, I mean, the talk I'm going to give today. So Lamek asked me to talk about applications in data science, of data science in healthcare. As Lamek said, I am a senior research fellow at the University of Manchester and the Christie. So I have been working in radiotherapy for a long time. So I will, that's going to be the focus of my talk. But before we go into that, so I went into PubMed um, because it's a very wide talk, so right, applications in healthcare. And the only thing I did is I did I checked review articles in the last year. And then I found use of data-based or data-driven applications either in artificial intelligence or natural language processing in many, 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 many different places. So this was for diagnosis, for example, for treatment, but also for follow-up. And this is actually only, I just picked up five of the most recent review papers. So when we're talking about a review paper, it's because there is enough work behind in publications to actually make it kind of mature, to be able to join them all together. So this is actually telling us that there are many data-driven applications going on in healthcare at the moment, like so many that if we will take the whole week talking about this, I mean, we'll be no, no, not even have enough time to talk about them all. So to be able to talk about 
nice things in half an hour, let's focus on radiotherapy. So in my particular field, again, radiotherapy, uh, there are many, many concrete examples, and I'm going to give you a couple. But before we go into that, let's talk about radiotherapy, just that we all know what we're talking about. So radiotherapy is, the, is, the, is a cancer treatment which you use radiation to kill or to, to damage cells, hopefully only cancer cells. So the point is that you put you, you point a beam of ionization radiation like this, but this is an example, this is just a schematic, and it goes into the cells, it breaks the DNA, and most of the cells, especially the cancer cells, are very bad at repairing themselves. So when they are completely damaged, the body simply comes and eliminates them. So that is the basic function or the basic concept behind radiotherapy. And the way, practically speaking, how it is actually delivered is a patient comes um, and sit down on this kind of machines that I hope you can see my, my, my mouse. This is a linear accelerator so that the, ra the radiation is going to be produced there and it's going to be thrown, let's say, sent through this little hole down and it's going to pass to the patient and then the radiation then it's going to make all its magic. It's going to damage the cells, hopefully only the, the cancer cells, there's always a balance there. And then the patient will come many, many times, that is called fractions. And then uh, we can take between one week and six weeks easily, the, the radiation treatment, right? So if you think about it, so this is the field I'm working in. So when, yeah, I'm going to give you a little bit more context to see where data-driven applications can actually have the most impact on it. So this is a very simplified um, work, workflow. So the first thing you do when you have a radiotherapy, when someone decides, okay, this patient needs to have radiotherapy is treatment decision. What type of radiotherapy the person needs, how many fractions, where, what type of radiotherapy, so proton therapy or photon beam, these kind of things, all of them are decided. In between many, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary team that joins in and finds the best treatment path for a patient. And then for that, you need, normally you need, you have imaging. So that images are, is showing where the tumor is, where the cancer is. And you also have blood tests, you have the rest of information from the, from the patient. And then all that together are what the doctors use to be able to find the best treatment path. In the moment in which radiotherapy is chosen, then a patient comes and then they take a CT scan. So this is a drawing of a machine. There are many more models, of course. And then we have an image like this. In this image, what, the, uh, what you can see is the internal anatomy of the patient. And the first thing that you do is you, uh, you find the organs are important so that the organs that if you put too much radiation, they will damage. So you need to find them in the image. You need to keep them safe, spare them from radiation. And you also find the region, for example, here is supposed to be a tumor. So where the cancer is, so the tumor, the part that you want to eliminate, so where you want to aim all the radiation you want to try and eliminate that part of the tissue. The next step is uh, comes a person and then the normal is a physicist, and then they create a, um, a plan. So a radiotherapy plan. So this is how you're going to move the machine that we saw before, the linear accelerator, and how it's going to then deliver the radiation in different angles, such that the most dose is given to the region where the cancer is, and the least dose is given outside. Yeah, so there are these big three steps, image acquisition, image segmentation, and treatment planning. And each of these different steps have a quality assurance. So every time someone makes a delineation, in theory, another doctor should come and look at it and say, well, you know, this bead is a bit too big, this is too small, careful here. So this kind of, uh, it's a lot of time in between. And you know where I'm going to, right? I'm talking time, resources, many people involved. Um, and after that, then comes the delivery. As I told you, the patient comes not only one time, but several times. And then when you put them in the treatment machine, then you take an image, a common CT scan. And if you want any kind of discussion or any kind of concepts or extra questions about this part, you can ask Lamech because his PhD was a lot based on common CTs. So when you have a common CT scan, you're actually able to see where the patient is, be sure that the patient is positioned in the right place every single time, because it's many, many times, 23 times the patient sitting down, lying down on the couch, 
And every time you try to put it exactly in the same place, right? And again, this is a, this is a quality assurance spot that is very important because you want to be sure that you are hitting the right spot, that the radiation is going where the cancer is and not where the healthy tissues are. And the last step is follow-up. Follow-up, so treatment has finished, patient goes back home, and then maybe one month, three months, six months, 12 months, two years, three years, the patients come back every time, and then they just double check, how are you feeling, all these kind of questionnaires from the doctor. And there will be also sometimes images taken just to be sure that the, treat, the tumor is not coming back. There can be some exams. And again, all this kind of, that you keep on collecting data from the patients. Most of the times from the side of the, of, the, of the clinicians, but nowadays also with many apps and many wearables, you can actually also collect a lot of information from them to try and find the best way to, to, to deal with the side effects because it's a treatment that can have very, very strong and lo long lasting side effects. So now that we have radiotherapy in our minds, this very simplified workflow, then we can see what are the aims of any data science applications in radiotherapy. First is to make things faster. We talk about all these many steps that people are doing things, other people is checking, or people are moving, are control checking, are uh, quality assuring, passing to the next step, passing to the next step. So the best thing will be to make things better, faster, sorry. So for example, the segmentation, registration, planning, plan QA, but also for example, image acquisition. I forgot to include that one here. We want to make things better. So if we, if we, if we are able to actually free time in these things that took a lot of time, maybe you can start focusing on things that are more difficult and making those better. Or even you can have AI or any kind of data science applications, of course, data driven uh, to help to help improve uh, things. I will give you an example of this. And the last one, which is a very, very exciting field is making things possible. Because of, we are, as, as you saw in this, in radiotherapy, you actually get so many images of the patients during the treatment, during before, during the treatment, and even after. You can start analyzing the images that is inside there, and then try to pick up, for example, textural changes, and that will be called radiomics, or you can start seeing how things are changing. So for example, if the tumor is reducing, if it grows again, you can start picking up these kind of things. You can start picking biomarkers. So things that an image is telling you beyond the image. So you can start trying to quantify stuff and to improve as well things in the, in the future. So following this article, so if you are interested in reading a little bit more, this is a very nice perspective article published already in 2020, so it's already some time ago. And they take, well, they, 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 up, they break the, the pathway in more steps, but I just kept it a bit more concrete. And that they mentioned, if you think about in the decision step, AI or actually database, data, sorry, data-driven applications can be used to better personalize combine uh, the treatment, right? So if you, if you know that the patient is, has diabetes and then you have enough data to be able to find a link between diabetes and a bad side effect, then you know that you prefer to give a different treatment to this patient because of the characteristics. So one thing is clinical. So for example, having another, another um, sickness or another disease, uh, genomic, for example, looking at the genes themselves, which is very interesting. And of course, my side is the imaging data. If you look at the image, you're able to find things in it. I will show you in a while. Then you can say this patient is better to go this direction rather than this other direction in the treatment. So that is a one nice gap where um, data driven applications can work. Planning, that's where we do a lot of stuff. So you can improve image acquisition. We have some, someone in the group working on that. I didn't include a, an example for that, but if you want to know about it, about it, just contact me and I can put you in contact. You can automate organ, organ segmentation. You can help the doctors do a delineation better. So find a way where the tumor is in the images in a better way. And you can also create a plan that is more optimal than just someone clicking and clicking and clicking in theory. So these are a couple of uh, very punctual examples of applications. 
In delivery, as we saw, the patient comes many, many times, and if we can find a better way to, to manage the motion, so every time a patient comes in, it's a little bit different. For example, it ate uh, a big lunch one day, and the next day he didn't have anything, only water, so you will have a big difference, for example, in the abdomen, or a person had a cold, so he had a congested nose one day, and the next day he didn't have it, or what, the next week didn't have it. So there's some changes that can have impact and some of ones that are not so important, but it still will be a very good way to try and manage this thing. And one important one that we don't work on, but I know there's many, many groups working, is to help scheduling. So if you have, for example, three different machines and you have 150 patients coming, what is the best way to plan them in the four machines that such so that the patients don't interrupt the treatment, but also that you have the best use of your machines. It's a double-sided, it's a very, very cool, um, feel itself, but yeah. So if, if you're interested, that's also another way to go. And finally, follow up. If you have an image of a patient or if you have something from the patient, it would be the best to, for example, see whether the patient could um, is going to, to have a side effect or a very strong one or not so strong. And then if you know that the patient is going to have a side effect, for example, the patient is going to suffer from dry mouth, because of the radiation that damage the, the salivary gland, then you can from the beginning and start training the, the patient how he can handle that by having extra water, extra this, extra um, medication and so on. So this is, these are very nice gaps where data science could actually very much impact only radiotherapy. And again, this is very, very down in radiotherapy as a cancer treatment. But if you go back and you think about surgery, you go back, you think of it, and there are many, many places where you can actually do great changes. So as I told you, I'm going to give you four examples of applications that we are working in our group. And the first one is about segmentation. So you remember you have a CT scan and you want to find the little bits in the, in the image that correspond to the organs. So for example, in this one you have, in green, this is a brainstem, in blue, the backside is um, the spinal cord, the mandible and the parotid glands, and then here you can see it better. So this is a work from one, one of my PhD students, Ed, who is fantastic and has done great work. Um, and what you have here is he adapted a 3D unit. So these are a, a convolutional neural network. And he adapted to be able to find a segmentation model, so a model that finds those bits of anatomy in the images, but with a very, very limited data set. And not only he did that, but he also showed that if you have a very limited data set, but that data set is of high quality, has a big, uh, sorry, has a better performance than having a very big data set where the, con the, the consistency or the quality of the, of the input data, the training data is less good. And that is using the same model, the very same model. So he had, for example, in here in green, if you see the lines in here in green, are showing the contours that are generated by um, training data. And this model with 34, 34 examples, yes. And they're highly I mean, curated. So everybody came here and they, they double check and they revise it until everybody agreed. So a, a group of five people, I think they agreed that these are the real contours of the organ. And then next to it, he, he, so the staple, those are the contours that I tell you the people agreed on, so the yellow ones. The red, the green ones are the ones that work with a very limited data set and the yellow one in, and the red ones are the ones that are with the largest data set. And in general, the red one is not misbehaving too much, but it's making it a lot smaller here, for example, also in this side. But the interesting bit is that it's finding, for example, parotid glands in the middle of the air, or it's finding here, this is the spinal cord, it's finding a spinal cord out here. And that's not really, likely, right? I mean, spinal cord in the back of your head, not really likely. So the cool thing is that he's able to show that quality in, in, in image, in, in, in data science and data-driven applications like this one is actually more important than quality, quantity. And that has been shown in the past in other, in other fields, but never in radiotherapy. So that's very cool. So that is one. And once you have this model, you can make things faster. Because in theory, if you have this image, you pass this model, you have, for example, 20 odd 
organs already delineated and that frees time for the next step, right? In, 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 the, in, the, in the workflow we saw. Another thing that we see is that um, peer review in minor segmentation. So one thing is if you ask two different doctors to delineate the same bead, so for example, this is a breast, the doctors will of, often have a small differences. This one is very large because there were some training doctors and some people who were not really even doctors, I mean, like me. So then there is, this is a bit more exaggerated, but the, the key point is that there are differences. And if we are talking about the targets so or where the, where the cancer is, so where the tumors are, they can actually impact directly the treatment. So what we did is we'd have a, a little, um, machine learning uh, model that is actually finding the regions that are most error prone and they highlight it to the doctor. So you see it here, so it's coming here and if you are doing a lineation, you stop and it says this location is too close to the skin. So it's giving nice tips on where the system thinks there are some errors and then allows the doctors to actually improve it or change it. And this is uh, some work we have done in collaboration with Mirada and not exactly the same, but something more is coming in Estro 2022 and in Mika 22. So if we talk again in three weeks, I can show you very, very exciting new things. And then this is another, this is an example on which allow us to say, make things better. So you have a contour and by, by highlighting regions where, where maybe there is a, a little inconsistency, you allow the, the, the delineation to become better. And therefore we hope uh, the treatment outcomes in the future to improve. And this is something that's very close to my heart, is some of my work, um, is outlook, um, outcome modeling, and that's what Lamek was mentioning. So this is image-based data mining. So in this case, where you're using the images of the patients, in this case, I have 210 head and neck cancer patients, you have the images of the patients, and then what you do is you have the, 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 the treatment of the patient, and then you map it into a reference patient. For that, you use a uh, non-rigid registration. And once you have that, then you can analyze if the dose you have given to that part in the, in the anatomy is connecting or is linked to an outcome that you are looking at. In this case, I'm showing you something about feeding tube insertion. And then we found these regions. So this is a large region in the back, this region in the middle, and this region in the front. These two are understandable because this is the tongue and this is the, um, uh, one of the muscles that helps you swallow. So if you, if you have those ones compromised, it's likely that you stop eating and then you need a little feeding tube. So they put a tube inside to help you uh, keep nutrition levels okay. The interesting bit that came out was this, this top here. This is the brain stem. So this is in the brain. So we didn't expect anything to be connected. But actually we have a hypothesis that the dose coming to the to this part in the brainstem is actually influencing the swallowing cap capability. And again, if we talk in three weeks, I will tell you, I will show you something that is backing this up with another data set uh, that we're going to present in Estro 2021. So let's talk about, I don't know, this in maybe three weeks and I show you. But cool, so this is an example of again, how we can make things better. Because if we find the region, for example, in this or that, that is driving a side effect or that is making patients be sick or sicker after treatment, and we are able to reduce the dose in that part, we're actually improving the outcome of the patient because patients will be healthy after that, so they will survive cancer, and they will also have less side effects from the treatment. So that is actually a win-win situation. So this is an amazing again. So this is a way that you can actually do it. And the last thing I wanted to tell you today is biomarkers. So we, if we look at the images again, so you can actually start in the images, you can get a lot more information than just, okay, this is, a, this is the kidney, this is the liver and so on. But you can also get like signs of sickness. In this case, this is work led by Andrew, yeah, and, and Donald. And then they were looking at sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is when you're, when you're getting old, you know, the muscle becomes less strong. And it's simply because it's loose less, less often and it gets a little bit more fatty. And that is a very good way to assess how fit a patient is. And then they did uh, the train at CNN. Again, it's a very simple CNN, it's unit based as, as well. And then this is the ground through the network. And then they were able to actually get from normal images, the same region. And they, they were able to find 
that if you have a if you're more sarcopenic, then actually your treatment works less good. Okay, so this one is very cool because suddenly we are making things possible. We're able to look at an image and be able to say this patient is going to have, the, if it goes this way of the treatment, it's going to have a negative impact. So let's try to find a better treatment for this. So it can be used actually for the first step when we want to decide what treatment is, can be given. So data science applications in therapy is a very exciting field. Um, it, it has many, it has accelerated many tasks in radiotherapy. And we just saw with the four examples I gave you that can make things faster, better, and possible. But, because there is of course always a but, most of these models are trained in a way that they are a black magic, a black box. So it's kind of input, there's some data-driven magic happening inside and you have an output. And what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that if I train my data in this small group of patients, so for example, only here in the Christie where we have only Brit mostly British patients, can I just take that model and bring it down back to my home country, Colombia, or bring it down to you guys in Namibia? That's a big question, we don't know. And we cannot really easily test. Another one is, well, if I have an interpretability, is the answer that I'm giving, I'm getting from this black box 100% certain? No, it's mostly not because it's, it's a value that you have between zero and one and we just decide a threshold and we say, this is one, then this should be radiotherapy. If we decide it, it should be chemo radiotherapy or something like that. So we need to be able to put a kind of a certainty measure next to it. And it's something that is still missing and it's very important. And the last question is how did it arrive to that given conclusion? And there are many, many examples on that in, in for example, in diagnosis, but because of time, I, I will not tell you, but let's read it up. So we have a little uh, editorial that we wrote down in just out uh, in March 2022, and we actually explore or we summarize some techniques for our image insight on which you can actually evaluate models that have been already been trained before. So we don't have fingers inside how to go and look inside the box, but we can start changing the input to try and see what happens to the output. And that's one of the things we, we propose. And, if you are interested, it's a, it's a nice read, I think. It starts with chihuahuas and, and blueberry muffins. Good point. And the next thing is that we need to learn from other disciplines. This is an amazing work led by Marianne in the group in which they, they are actually going, they're talking to people in the aviation industry in collaboration with Rolls-Royce. And they're making a kind of a framework to make the best from artificial intelligence and data-driven applications in radiotherapy. So to include social aspects, accuracy and trust and governance. So where the data is, what is it, bios, who, who owns these things? And again, if you're interested, this is a nice, a nice article. And in here, it's a very long link, sorry for that. But that you have the adapted framework, which is, is, is a very, very good read. And it's very good to keep that in mind. So just to conclude with one, one minute to go. Um, so. Uh, artificial intelligence applications driven by data, or pretty much data science is based on, can accelerate many, many tasks in radiotherapy. It's already doing it in some of the clinics, not everywhere, but in some places that are a bit more advanced, uh, avant-garde, so they are a bit more open-minded, then they're doing it. And I, I ha we have seen that it can make things faster, better, and possible, which is great. It's an, a great, great potential to come. But we always keep in mind, especially in healthcare, applications that interpretability and generalizability are very important. Can I take my model from here and drop it somewhere else, somewhere else and expect the same performance? Can I take, um, can I actually, how can I validate that that is happening? So that is when you are designing these kind of applications, you have to keep that in mind. How can I validate my results? then you can think about doing things in, in steps. For example, you can segment and then the segmentation can easily be at, at, uh, validated. And then from that point, you get a number or whatever, and that goes into a model. So that's a, a, a way to go for it. Or you can also, what we, did, what we propose in the editorial, if you have a model, you can just perturb the input and see what happens to the, to the output. And that is going to tell you how robust the model is. But it's still many, there are many roundabouts and it's not something nicely and, and prepared. So that is important you guys keep in mind when in the future when you are des designing your, your data-driven applications. Um, and yeah, that is important. 
And the last thing is that there are many, many fields who are a lot more advanced or more mature in, in this kind of task. And then we need to just go there, reach out and learn from them. And I think with this, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I, I would love to see you if you have any questions or not. And that's it. Lamek? Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. Good afternoon, Dr. Rihanna. Uh, thank you for Dr. Lamek. My name is Herman Benjimi. Um, so I'm going to give the floor some time. Let me to the assist again uh, for questions. Uh, if anyone in the building has any questions, please raise your hand and then Dr. can attend to that. Are there no questions? Okay. Comments? Are we getting tired? What's happening? Okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'll post my own question. So, uh, Doctor, thank you so much for that uh, informative and uh, alluding to the fact that um, data science has so many applications uh, and it cuts through so many disciplines. Um, my question talks to the accuracy um, of, of most of these models um, and then um, looking at um, uh, say different regions uh, uh, across the, the, the world, how accurate are certain models and how can we refine them uh, to, to, to consider the generalization that you're talking about so that uh, when you uh, say adapt it uh, from Europe and bring it to Africa or in Namibia, they say, and then we can quickly evolve and make it work just as it were. Yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, at least in radiotherapy, there are very um, concrete metrics that you can use. So for example, if you are creating models for segmentation, as the one I showed you from Ed in the head and neck, then we know that we can look at counters made by an expert. And then you can actually look at the, you can calculate the differences, the distance between the counter created by the expert and the counter created by the, by the model. Right, so it's very easy, not easy, it's very standardized. So if you, if you know that the distance, the mean distance between the two contours is below two millimeters. Why two millimeters? I don't know, but two millimeters seems to be the magical number. So if it's between, if it's between two to three millimeters, you are fine. You're happy in the sense that the contours that you're creating are in the same range of error as the contours that a person will do. Yeah, so you remember this, this slide I showed you with many different contours. So that has been done in many, many different sites. And it is very, is very common, it's, it's, it's known that there are errors. So then it is the range that is important. So we need, that's how it starts. So we, you first start and you need to validate, you need to calculate, estimate, quantify that the values that you are getting are in the same level as the ones you were getting before, before the the data science that that has been application is in, in, introduced, right? And once you have that, so you have the, the same baseline, you can start thinking about incre increasing it. So that's that's how we'll go in segmentation, which is the easy one. For example, in planning is a little bit more difficult because there are differences in clinics. Some people, some clinics are more hot than other clinics. But at the end of the day, if you think about race therapy. The very, very, the most important point is at the end of the treatment, whether the, the cancer has been eliminated. So the treatment outcome patient is, is healthy and it doesn't have big side effects. So this is the, the, the end real value, but, but that is again, really high above. So yeah, so again, going back to your question, you will need to go into finding some very clear metrics of what, and then finding a baseline, what is the what is that metric looking like right now? And then you compare that to what the model is doing. And that's the best way to actually validate that the model is doing what it's supposed to be doing with your new population. What we do, for example, in the case of Ed, is that we have three big data sets. We train in one, we validate in the second, uh, no, sorry, we train in two, so the small and the big one, and then we validated in a, in a third data set that the, the models have never seen, and they were from 
from the Netherlands, I think. So we have different data sets from different. So the, the small data set is American and European, the second one as well, and the third one was only Dutch. So that's a way to capture the variation. Did, did yeah. you somehow answer the question? Sorry, I cannot see your face. I don't know if I'm going in a rabbit hole when I'm answering. Yes, yes, I think you did uh, in like, and touch on that. Um, if we don't have any questions, I think we can proceed on to the next part of our program. Um, so uh, this is the end of our official and online session. So, um, so excuse me for that. From here, we'll proceed on to the lunch break. Um, and thereafter, we will then uh, break into the teams. Uh, doctor, before maybe you can leave us, um, I think I would like the uh, group to give uh, a big round of applause and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It really is yeah. a honor to be online, but it's a honor to be part of your of your of your event. Uh, I hope yeah. I hope the best and enjoy and have fun in the hackathon. Okay. Thank bye you bye. So much. All right. Right. Bye, doctor. So. Guys, uh, we're going to break and go for our lunch, and then day after we will uh, pick up with our tutorial. I believe the tutorials are meant to start at one. Um, our lunch is uh, from now till that time. If we go over, we'll probably just look at how we can change the logistics and then, um, yeah, pick up from there. So all the best with the hackathon, and I hope to see, yeah, the solutions. Okay. Right.